Heavily? Yes. Clemish? Here. Michael? Here. Schultz? Here. Williams? Healy? Here. Harms? Here. Okay. Do you have any additions or corrections to the minutes? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any opposed? And motion carried. Got any more items to add to the agenda tonight? That's correct. Actually, it's quite 
Schultz? Yes. Williams? Yes. Sheely? Yes. Carnes? Yes.
Um, I've watched the late development in the late 90s as they installed a ski ramp and slalom ski course um, and prepared the lakefront property uh, doing dirt work um, to expand the lake for a development. Um, over the years, the development has showed uh, slowing down and um, it's something that I would like to finish. Um, that was started uh, so many years ago. Lake Lexus holds uh, good memories for me and is a place that will always be a big part of my life. Um, it has always been my dream to own this lake uh, since I was a kid. And now that my dream has come true, I would like to restore it how it once was and possibly a little bit better. Um, I would like to continue the idea that they started in the late 90s um, to build a well-maintained lake with beautiful trees, landscaping, um, and a very nice outdoor feeling. Um, this will be a very clean development with strict rules to keep the lake a beautiful place. The lake area will be very spacious. Um, there on the north side, as you can see, um, it would be, sorry, it would be on the, uh, not the first one, it would be the green, it's more green. It would be on the north side of the lake, there will be 12 houses um, on that north side there. Um, and then on the south side of the lake, there will be a combination of uh, 20 lake homes with 80 campsites. The, Water, electric, septic systems have all been engineered and approved by the utility companies and contractors. Um, as the owner of the lake, um, I actually do own the, the lake itself and the acres on the northwest and uh, the south side also. Um, by owning that lake, I will uh, maintain that lake as far as uh, water levels, shorelines. There is an overgrowth of weeds uh, there right now, and I've already talked to uh, the government companies to get the proper permits to clean that out and uh, make the place look a lot better. Um, I would also take care of uh, any silting and lake access um, as far as people being allowed to a lake, uh, so on and so forth. Um, the, one of the concerns was, when I talked to the neighbors, was the size. Uh, basically, if they were <coughs> enough, uh, as far as the houses go. So I copied and pasted in the second picture that you have there. Uh, a current house, <laughs> and I don't know the square footage of that house. But I copied and pasted that all on the property, so you can see that there was adequate space uh, for all of the houses in the development with room to spare. Um, so with the septic systems, um, uh, I go through uh, McCoy Construction. He's very uh, educated and he's been doing this for a long time. Um, basically, with the first map, I think that's actually in your guys' packet showing the location. Oh, it is. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So you can kind of see. If you look at this poster, I know it's hard for you guys to see back here, but uh, you'll see the lakefront property. Uh, I'm just going to hold it up here. Okay, so this picture in the center here, it's the picture that you're seeing on there. So the houses border the whole uh, lakefront area here and basically the rules for your septic system 
So for every 10 units, you need uh, 1,500 for every 1,500 gallon, for, or for every 20 units, you need a 3,000 gallon septic system. Um, so uh, the septic systems will be located in these back grass areas with drain fields. Um, on this also back here, uh, away from the lake. This is also elevated over here, probably 10 feet above the lake. Um, so you don't have to worry about uh, groundwater and stuff. I've talked to LaCroix about that. Um, they said that will not be an issue as far as that goes. Um, electric. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, so they will be lake homes. So basically uh, how I would say it is this development idea comes from I fish a lot up uh, north like Wabe, Bitter, Ponset. They all have these lake area developments where people basically they're vacation homes and they go there either during the week or the weekends. Um, like one of my friends has one at Ponset. We go up there in the winter, we ice fish. Um, there are a lot of fish in Lake Alexis. Um, so I could see people ice fishing or fishing there. Um, I didn't really put a time constraint on it as far as how long they could stay, I guess. Um, I wouldn't really want to call them cabins, I guess. When I think of cabin, I think of something small. I think of something that is not built to its full potential, I guess. Um, you, if you look at some of these uh, examples here, uh, I would like a lodge there. And they're a story, a story and a half, depending on what the people would like to have for a size. If they would like a bigger home, uh, then we would put that there. Um, they would have the uh, chance to either uh, build something bigger if they would like on a bigger lot, um, but they will have adequate space. They will not be tight together. There will be rules on that. Who would they own the home and lease the land? Or how Correct. They own the land? Correct. So since we're talking about long, long term, it's not going to be a rental for a day. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, basically, another example. Um, I can put this back here. It's almost similar to Mr. Oliver's yeah. property that we approved, where it's you know, kind of wasting people away from Sioux Falls to so spend. Correct. So, those ones um, at Kurt Oliver's place, his uh, rent there is close to $5,000 for six months. And his homes, they're, his, they're, they're tiny homes. They are 14 feet wide by 40 feet long. And he has, he probably has 70 or so on, so far, on eight acres out there. Um, they're a little bit tight for me. I wouldn't want to have them that tight. Uh, also, as far as the size, I, I wouldn't want homes like that. Uh, they would be there, out there. Um, I don't have a size restriction exactly, but like as you can see in my pictures, I think those would just be too small for what I'm shooting for. Is there any chance to what you said, what size each one of these lots are going to be? They will not be lotted out. Um, as far as that goes, uh, because I will not be selling the lot. Um, as far as the dimension of, say, the campsites, uh, the campsites would be 50 feet wide. I have it on here. I don't remember for sure. They'd be about 50 feet wide by 80 feet long. And that'll vary as it curves around and stuff. Um, it's not a square uh, patch of land, so. Uh, You'll kind of have to finagle it as we dig in the sites. On this page, thirty by fifty. By yeah, 50. On this page, yeah. You look at houses. There's mm -hmm. on the door side. There's twelve houses on six acres, so half an acre about thirty. And that would also vary uh, with the shoreline. Um, 
the people, some people want to dock and stuff. So I will, uh, they will own part of the shoreline also as the land underneath of it. Uh, as of right now, there are pins on that property for other people's property that there is actually no pin that says so many feet into the water from this pin is what it says. So I probably do the same thing. So they own part of that front just because of the water levels and uh, go up and down there. It's not very controlled, um, but I do have plans to control the water levels in the future also. So would there be a public access for the people that are in the camp sites? Um, I, don't, that work? I don't know if I would call it a public access. Um, in the picture, um, there is a dock. Certain people will be allowed at certain times uh, to go in. Yeah, it would be in that, uh, let's see, it'd be the southwest corner of the area. Um, and it, as you can see in the picture on the, uh, the screen there, it's very there's a lot of reeds in there and that all have to be cleared out uh, versus in your picture that you guys have up there. That's how it used to be. That whole area used to be a boat turnaround and it's just been uh, not maintained for so long that the reeds just grew in. Okay, so but yeah, as far as the boat ramp question goes, um, there will be a boat ramp. I don't know if I call it a public boat ramp. This is what they call uh, a section five lake. It's a private lake. Um, it oh, was, so by public, I meant for the campers. So yes. Really access the lake is my question. I guess I wasn't clear enough. Yeah. So it would be uh, right on the right where this cursor is. There is, uh, you can see where the water used to be right there. So the dock would be right on this side here. Correct. Uh, BY water, uh, the pipe is up here on this north road, uh, 305, up here, uh, that goes uh, directly into that top um, uh, six acres up here. And then I will uh, come down this side and come in uh, for the water here and electric is already here also for the south side and then the septic and stuff will be uh, divided among these houses up here and then the same thing here uh, in the back lots. Do you want to be talking Yes, um, I am approved to, uh, it was just engineered and approved from um, Mike Mutter, I think is his name. My mother told me um, that there's uh, enough, I had to pay an engineering fee and so forth to apply for the connection, and that was all approved. And so do you have a playground area for the campers? Yes, um, that would be, uh, in that picture, it would have been towards the, the center area of the, the campground, of the biggest loop. What about on the other side of the campground? Uh, the north side? Yeah. Um, the north side, I was more for uh, it's more of a housing development than anything. Um, there would just be 12 houses, and uh, there would really, that was more along the lines of, I don't know, 
explain it, I guess. Just people. Yes. <laughs> yep, you said it. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> yep, I just kind of wanted to keep that a little bit different class, I guess you could, you could say. It was already divided in the property um, on the north side, plus especially once I dig out all of those reeds on that side um, and clear it up, I think, uh, especially the close uh, shoreline. I think it'll be a, a lot different class of people on that side. I'm also pretty big into uh, like tree transplanting. Um, at, at my other businesses, I've transplanted hundreds of trees. I really like transplanting big trees. Um, so you don't have to wait for them to grow. Uh, so that really gives it that outdoor feeling. Uh, I like the autumn blaze maples probably the most. They uh, change really pretty colors in the, in the fall with the yellow and the red and stuff. Um, also landscaping and stuff to make the place look great. I'll do that at the entry. Um, I actually don't have that picture on here, but there'll be like a, a block entry uh, coming in as kind of like a gate. And you have a designated area for refuse? For garbage? what? Garbage? Uh, yes. So um, the garbage area, basically how I have it figured out is I have a uh, dumpster per uh, 50 places pretty much how, is how I've been working it out in the last five years at my other places. Um, if it does get to be more than I just add more, it's just sectioned out on the land. So if I had to guess, it would be like one on the east loop, and then probably two on the middle loop, and then one on the uh, six acres there on the north side. And it would be fenced in around it, um, just like my other parks, to where it would be secluded. Space for parking for the whole planet, but they're on a half acre lot. Yes, yes. I personally live on a half acre myself, and I feel I have plenty of room. Uh, honestly, sometimes I feel like I could have another house right on my property. And like compared to houses in town, some of the houses are just five, six feet apart, ten feet apart. These would be, you know, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 feet apart at least. Is there room for two-way two traffic on your lanes? Yes. Um, the road size that um, I've always gone with is about 35 feet wide. It tends to have uh, enough room for three cars wide, so there's plenty of room for two. 35 feet has always been uh, the road size that I've gone with in my other establishment. It seems like you've got an awful lot of awful lot of work here. This thing is got to get rezoned to make this happen, isn't it? Yeah. Um, what, what did you think you would have come to us for? What do you mean? Yeah. I know. I mean, you've got a very detailed plan. Don't get it wrong. Yeah. That's why. That's what this meeting. That's why I, I applied for this meeting is to get it rezoned. Gary, do you want to explain that it's, it's, it's a what R2 right now? Correct. Basically, I'm rezoning it to plant units so that it can have the mixed use. 
Yeah, there's been a couple more. Uh, uh, let's see, Randy. Yeah, Randy uh, Golden also just did the same thing. Uh, Randy Golden just did the same thing on uh, the lake road there. Uh, he is uh, doing uh, tiny homes or lake houses. Uh, I don't know what that was going to be. And then we go down Chalkstone Hill. This is the first one on the left, and he's going to do campers and cabins and stuff there also. There again, it's kind of, his was mixed, so he had to do a PUD. Uh, it's kind of the same with this. Kurt Oliver with his tiny homes, I don't think he had to do that because it wasn't mixed. I think we did a campground, but I really think the tiny I, yeah. Yeah, and those are a little bit different too for me. Like, I think those ones are like they have the tiny homes. Like, I would like to build something really nice. I don't feel that a 14 foot by 40 foot uh, cabin or tiny house is uh, as nice as something that's 30 by 40 or, or whichever two story or story and a half. I was basically, in this whole design, I'm looking for a different class of people. Like Kurt Oliver, I believe, hit that class of people where uh, it's very, very nice and the people that are in there are keeping very good care of the property. I think he did a good job on uh, narrowing down the people that come in there and making it a nice place. I think that, that matters a lot. What were, what were the classifications where Oliver's was it was a rural residential. Yeah, it would be there was a shed. Uh -huh. There was a shed that he wanted to expand that was in a residential, and the, in the uh, development was actually in the lake side. Right, it's got just like a line. Yeah, this is a little bit, but this line, what about a mile south of Utica? Correct, and in the R2 zoning, uh, campground is actually part of the R2 zoning, um, but I just didn't feel that uh, a campground was something that uh, this wasn't fully described as a campground to me. I think this was more of a lakeside development, in my opinion, like I said with Wabe and Ponset and Bitter, how they built theirs. And, and this is already zoned residential. It's not like this. I just call it a kind of use that we can use that already residential zone. Correct. I could have I could have applied for the campground because it is zoned for that already. But I just felt like you said the PUD was something more that we needed uh, instead of just the campground. Uh, I just felt like it would be better to be a PUD and rezone to the PUD. So what surrounds this upside of this property? Uh, to the south is a cornfield. Um, to the east is a cornfield. Um, to the west is, you can see a little uh, spring area over there with a cornfield, bean field. Um, to the north, um, northeast would be a cornfield, bean field. And then to the north, uh, west, above the 305, that is a field, but there is a house above that. That's actually the house that uh, I grew up in years ago. Um, and then there are, on the actual lake itself, there are three houses. Um, you see where it says Lakeshore Drive? Right there. Oh. So there's a house here, there's a house here, there's a house right here, and then there's two houses on this side over here that are existing houses. So with the, so this section here, uh, this is, this is mine at 56. This is, I don't know, I think this one's like point eight. Acres or something. So 
I can't read. And then this one, this little sliver here is like 0.2 or something. This one's three between here. This got subdivided between here and here. This house was sold um, out of this section. Um, I don't know how many years ago. And then I think the same thing happened over here. This house was sold out of this section over here um, just recently. I want to say four or five years ago, if I remember right. Some of the existing lots aren't even at an acre. Correct. Well, it's owned R2. I suppose the lot maybe were in there. The zoning was what 2001, is that correct? What's that? 2003. So the development started in '96. Um, and then the first house, I believe, was this house here, was built. And then I believe this one shortly thereafter. Um, I want to say this was, gosh, I'd have to look at it for sure. I don't remember the dates. If I had to guess, the first house was probably 99, I would say, something like that. The second house, maybe 2000, almost. That's just what I remember from when I was growing up. I, I, don't, I don't know the exact date. It's nice place it's going to be, uh, you know, some very nice homes surrounded by egg, egg land. Correct. Have you talked to the adjacent landowners about any of this? Yes, um, I actually, uh, the most, the one that I talked to probably the most was this, this home right here, uh, Matt Rumsey. Um, he's talked to me quite a bit and gives me constructive criticism, I would say. Um, he was concerned about the size of the houses um, out there um, and uh, you know if they would fit or not. That's why I uh, made that uh, map that I gave you guys is kind of showing uh, an exact perspective drawing on how they would fit according to the size of his house on there. Um, the other people I haven't been, I tried to contact, I believe this is Peter's and the Pedersons here uh, via Facebook. I didn't have a phone number or anything. Um, I never got a message back from them. And I think, I don't know if the son lives here and the dad owns land. I don't know that either, but I couldn't get a hold of them. But I have talked to, uh, this is Matt Arns right here. I talked to them. And I talked to Neil Lang on this property also. Um, I got little to no feedback back from them as far as how everything goes. I think they are here tonight. Um, I think one of the things that uh, kind of uh, upset them right off of the bat was the, the covenants on the property. Uh, what happened was uh, uh, John Lane, uh, I don't know if you, any of you guys recognize the name, but uh, John Lane uh, used to be a developer back here a long time ago. And uh, he put covenants on these properties out here. And um, the owner, one of the owners of the property, Chad Taylor, uh, was not involved in the making of these covenants. So these covenants are tied to the properties, but they're null and void uh, as far as that goes, because he did not sign off on the covenants. And I did talk to the state's attorney and he said that that doesn't matter in, in this situation. It shouldn't bear on any decision uh, of your guises, but I just wanted to explain that might be why they're upset. Did you talk to any of the adjacent ag land holders? 
Yes, the south one is uh, uh, Bob Chop, and then uh, I didn't get a hold. This is Heine, I believe. All right. Yeah, that's Heine's there, and then I didn't get a hold of. The, uh, I also tried to talk to him because I'd really like to work as a team, you know, with the with the community to make this, you know, a beautiful place, pretty much. You know, uh, for the fifty-six acres, roughly how much is land, how much is lake? So this year, if you measure this out, this is without this. If I dug this out where it was supposed to be here, um, this down here is about 14 acres, and this over here is just over six to seven acres. It's almost seven on this one. So it'd be 21 total. We've got that on here. Minimum requirements Yeah. And uh, like I said, I also do own the lake also and the land underneath of it. So um, what I was told is that even if I wanted to do like, do you see this one right here, this piece of property? See that point right there? It's in the middle of the water. So there is no pain here. So this gentleman actually owns this section here. It's, it's not exactly to this beacon, but um, he actually owns a part of that shoreline there. So what it says is it says from this line, uh, from this line, uh, 250 feet to this point, and then from this pin, uh, 750 feet, whatever it is to this point, is his property line. So there is actually no pin uh, in the land there. You actually have to measure it into the water. And I could do uh, what I was told that I could do the same thing that I wanted to do with just the R2 restriction. And if I wanted to build a piece of land or if I wanted to lot it out, I could lot it out uh, half an acre of water to give the person the waterfront and a half acre of land um, to put a house on there to give the one acre total for the R2 uh, restrictions. But I opted out to not do that and do the PUD instead. Does the board have any other questions before I ask that question? Is there uh, interest in the homes that you're building, or are you going to build them as like spec homes waiting for someone to be interested, or is this where you have like a site to be on that you build it? Um, so uh, basically, I would like to see it take off. There is a lot of interest, but in my opinion, until it's paid for, uh, interest really doesn't matter. I've had a list of you know 80 customers before and they say they want something and 40 of them actually pull through. So um, as far as uh, a spec place, a spec house, um, we'll probably build know, five or so, something like that. And then if it starts to take off, we'll do just like Kurt Oliver did. Uh, we'll keep moving with the project, you know, as the years go on. How long do you think it'll take you, man, to the whole thing done? Uh, so I do uh, a lot of the work myself uh, as far as dirt work and stuff goes. Um, I, so I had to guess if everything goes smooth. It never does. Five years, maybe, something like that, maybe a little bit more. Um, that would put me at so three, two, six, six a year, six homes a year, roughly, something like that. And they're not like huge homes. So I think that would be a doable as far as that goes. Um, I recently quit my dad's shop also, so I'm 
full time doing development. So uh, I do work all the way through winter and everything too. So um, I will definitely work hard to get it done as soon as I can. That's for sure. Campground up front first or get that done. Um, you got any idea what you're doing? I, I think I want to do uh, at least the homes and the trees towards like this point here along here, like the, the central development that you see on my uh, the poster. Okay. Um, I think I would like to do the homes and trees and stuff uh, like that. I know that there is a concern with the neighbors, and I don't want to make them mad. Um, I would I would like to get this secluded uh, to them. I know some of them. Uh, didn't want the smaller houses and stuff like that. So I would focus on getting the bigger houses in on the point and uh, the campground would be pushed on the back side to where they can't even see it with that hill area. This is this right here uh, is pretty high elevation here. This is, uh, I guess, 10 to 15 feet above water, at least 10 feet above. And then this is all hidden back here. Um, once I do my dirt work and everything for the roads and stuff like that, this will even be at a lower level than, than this right here. So I'd really like to, uh, I've heard some input as far as trees um, to make it so it's aesthetically pleasing to the neighbors on both sides, uh, on, on the north, whether it's the east or the west side, um, to make it so it's not an eyesore, even when I'm doing construction. Um, so everything's established on the front shoreline, and that's kind of why I put the houses along the whole shoreline, and then the campground towards the back. So this piece of ground was originally developed by the gentleman that's large and dug out the, and that the scheme, the scheme approach that sort of come out before it was just a total payout question to pay out what Road. There's a time when they did it, they were talking about putting a well in to feed that lake. Is that well there? Or is that operative? There is no well over the last, let's see, it's in 1996. So that would be 24 years. Um, in the covenants, it does say um, at the time or at some point in time, a well may be of question uh, to keep the lake at a maintained level. You know, that's overfilling to fill somebody's basement up or anything of the sort. Um, it says that and a uh, association to help keep the lake, uh, to maintain it, uh, could be made. <laughs> that association never got made in the last 24 years. What happened was the lake was meant to be, uh, with the covenants, was made to be uh, a part of the, the whole property and uh, it ended up being private because John Lane uh, forfeited the property to Chad Taylor who uh, did all of the dirt work out there and uh, he owed Chad money uh, and declared bankruptcy and the bank said hey what do you need to uh, take this lien off of the property. He said 56 acres, that he got 56 acres, and the lake included in that. So that's what caused like the slalom scheme to go. It used to be a ski ramp. I don't know if you any remember that. There used to be a ski ramp and a slalom course out there. All that got taken off. Uh, Chad tried selling some of the property, but he lives three, four hours away. And he said it just wasn't working for him. Uh, I talked to him and he sold it to me. The original talk about Chris well is a very problem because the lake water drains drain straight to the east because the railroad track jumps right into a farm place where they have trouble with water. Okay, so uh, you're talking this area right here? Yeah. Okay. I'm not over here. This is a, basically this whole corner of the This right here? Over here, on your other 
map that will show the woman's in her. Okay, so what that is from, the lake used to be correct. So the, that, to get to that level is 18 feet deep in the lake. The lake used to be about 18 feet deep. So when it started this summer, it was at 14 feet deep, uh, which was low, four foot low at the time. And I actually did talk to uh, the surrounding properties and asked to do a will out there at my cost and on my property, uh, just to only sustain the levels, not to raise it above 14 because 14, in my opinion, was a safe level to where it didn't flood uh, down there. I asked all of the uh, property owners also uh, if right now at that time, 14 feet was an issue if their basements were flooding, if their crops were flooding, uh, stuff like that. They said no, it was not an issue at the time. And I said I would just like to maintain that 14 foot level. Um, they disagreed. They did not want to, even though there are, were currently no issues at the time. And um, a month later, two months later, we lost two to three feet of depth out there and we lost six to 10 feet of shoreline out there. Um, I believe, I, I don't wanna talk bad. Uh, I, I just believe that the lake could be maintained a lot better than this. It is way harder to fill out a lake than it is to maintain the level. Uh, same thing with the reeds. Uh, if the reeds and stuff were cleaned out, um, and maintained, I feel like it would be uh, a much more beautiful place uh, to live or have a lakeside home. Any other questions before we ask the public? Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> hey, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this particular issue? My name is Matt Rumsey. I live on lot two on the property in question. I have about two minutes and 50 seconds of comments, but just for perspective, when you look at the picture that's nicely done here, those five homes in the upper left corner, there is 10 yards between Bob Chop's fence and the water to where it is right now. I stood on Bob Chop's fence with my range finder for 10 yards. We're gonna put five homes on 30 feet. It's roughly about, so if you look in the back where I su submitted, it shows there's a third of an acre that's available to where the water is right now today. So just for some perspective. Like I said, my home is on lot two of net depth additions, and I stand tonight in opposition to the proposal before the board to rezone the net bed addition from R2 rural development moderate density to a planned unit development. I stand in opposition because I don't want to see my hopes and dreams of owning a nice home in the country where my family would have the space and opportunity to enjoy nature uh, strike. My wife and I purchased our home six years ago with the understanding the county ordinance mandated the existing lots be divided in no smaller than one acre lots and the covenants governing the addition prohibited businesses, campgrounds, or little homes. The Yankton County Ordinance, Article 13, Planned Unit development intent section 1301 requires land of considerable size are developed redeveloped or renewed as integrated and harmonious units and where the overall design of such units is outstanding as to warrant modification of standard contained elsewhere in the ordinance a plan development to be eligible under this article must be number one in accordance with the comprehensive plans of the county including all plans for redevelopment and renewal number two 
composed of such uses and such proportions as are more appropriate and necessary for the integrated functioning of the plan development and the county. Number three, so designed in its space, allocation, orientation, structure, materials, landscaping, and other features as to produce an environment of stable and desirable character, complementing the design and values of the surrounding neighborhood, and showing such unusual merit as to reflect credit upon the developer and upon the county, and for a minimum of five acres in land use. I contend tonight the application falls short on all points except the acreage requirement. Additionally, Article 13, Section 1303 requires the applicant submit a site plan for the proposed plan unit development. The plan must be detailed, specific, and contoured, including elevations, landscaping, paved areas, transportation patterns, and water and sewer services. I believe if you review the application before you, it falls, fails on nearly all points. Specifically, the application has only vague comment on water, electric, and septic plan. In fact, as of today, Matt Turney of South Dakota DNR confirmed he has not been contacted or have any septic plans been submitted for approval for the development. These are just a couple of obvious requirements the applicant has neglected to address. I submit this as proof the plan development is not so outstanding as to warrant modification of the standard. I will close with section 1809 of the current ordinance, amendments and rezone, which states a recommendation of approval will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the public welfare as presented and testified to by the applicant. My wife, all the residents of Nedbed Edition and all available adjacent property owners, as you can see in your packet, contest that adding 112 new families to an addition designed for no more than eight new families would be injurious to the neighborhood and result in significant negative impacts for local agriculture, current residents, and county resources. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Carrie Ramsey. My home is on lot two of Nedbed Edition. I stand in opposition to the proposal before the board to rezone the Nedbed Edition from an R2 rural development moderate density to a planned unit development. I stand in opposition because I purchased my home with the understanding, based on current ordinance, I was buying into an area that could have at most eight new neighbors. I took great comfort in knowing the covenants governing the addition would ensure my family and I a quiet community with abundant opportunity to enjoy nature and the lake. I believe the official zoning, I believe the official zoning ordinance of Yankton County has accurately designated the Nedbed addition as R2. The 2003 Yankton Comprehensive Plan highlights that the current ordinance were born out of a lack of regulation, which resulted in a high concentration of homes on half-acre lots within large residential subdivisions. Yankton County's comprehensive plan lists five policies to govern residential development in the county. I feel policy number two, three, and four are most pertinent to this discussion. Policy two, restrict premature development of residential areas before proper infrastructure needs can be developed. This property in question has been for sale for development for nearly 20 years with little interest or activity. Policy three, Limit rural densities so that current serv services levels are not exceeded, thereby avoiding the creation of special purpose districts, i.e. sanitary, water, and road districts. Adding 112 new potential residents in eight acres when only four acres have access to water certainly would exceed the current infrastructure. Policy four, restrict development in areas where unsuitable soils and other physical limitations are present. The southernmost four acres consist of high levels of fill so soil from previous failed excavation activities and also are highly variable elevations and a high water table which present multiple challenges to the policy. I also wanted to highlight policies three and six pertaining to the commercial property. Policy three, locate commercial activities in close proximity to necessary infrastructure 
and policy number six, preserve environmental quality with regards to economic development. Adding 112 families to no more than eight acres, half of which is surrounded by a wetland with no infrastructure, flies in the face of both policies. Not only is rezoning Nedved's addition to a planned unit development inconsistent with the comprehensive plan goal for development, it is also inconsistent with the covenants that govern the addition. We have submitted the complete co covenants for your review. Upon review, you will find there are very, they are very specific about no business being run on the property and that each lot is used exclusively for single family residents at at least 1,250 square feet on the main level with a one car attached garage and parking for two vehicles. Trailers and campers are specifically prohibited. The covenants and 2003 ordinance are consistent with maintaining the current R2 zoning and inconsistent with rezoning. It is for these reasons I urge you not to allow this property to be rezoned. Thank you. Matt Aarons and I live on the very north lot on the property. Um, we're a longtime resident there since 2010. Uh, the Nedved addition have concerns with safety. With that many people coming in and they're not permanent residents, what kind of background checks and or do they have to have if they have or registered sex offenders, do they have to register because it's non-permanent residents? So that's a concern of ours. Also, with that many campsites and rentals, um, with the lake being the size that it is, we currently have a covenant that says one motorized boat on the lake at a time. With that many people, the safety issue is a concern of ours also, and ties into that we live 120 feet from the waterfront. And with that, we've had, we live along the road, the county road there, that people can access it from tub. We've actually had people come onto our property to come on and off the lake because of the rocks on the hike or on the road there are so rough that they come onto our property to enter the lake. That is a concern of ours if this is opened up to even more people uh, of coming onto our, our property. And then another concern is the wetland in the southeast corner of this property that, uh, that is considered wetland and with that many people, six 3,000 gallon septic tanks running into that area. Is that safe or is that a concern? And has it been tested? Has, it been, has there been anything showing that they can uh, sustain that kind of septic in use with that, without having to fill up the lake with sewage? Um, in closing, I have some concerns with uh, section 1723 of this. The picture that was on the internet today, uh, number five with property lines, square footage and proposed structures. There was no square footage or anything showing anything there. I mean, the picture looks wonderful the way it's set up, but I don't think it fits the actual property. Um, also the location and dimensions of all easements and right of ways, there's the 30 feet show there, that would take up about half of his area that he has there of actual property on the south side of that property. The number eight is general utilities and sewer plans. Uh, again, the, with Matt covering that already, I'll skip there. And then the, uh, the site drainage plan and development of culverts and such. I don't see that there. He said he's gonna do a lot of dirt work and a lot of that. I would like to know that before you guys uh, change uh, zoning on that. And then also with what he had said earlier, I just have a little concern of what he had mentioned during his with uh, him saying that he's going to own the whole property and rent the properties out. But yet then he turned around and said that he would sell half acre lots and then sell half acre water. Um, so that kind of concerns me with what kind of plan does he have with that, um, showing that he's talking two different ways on that. So, thank you. <coughs> Hello folks, Neil Lang. I don't have a whole lot to say other than uh, 
if any of you folks here would have been looking for property on a lake, private park property with neighbors not right next to your door and a campground surrounded by you. That's the reason, and the, I'm speaking for the neighbors too, that's the reason we, we bought our homes out there so we have a home, not a dang campground. And as far as, uh, maybe I misunderstood it, but I think Evan said that the lot was 50 by 80. Was that correct? 30 by 80 is what it says in the back picture. What said it was 50 by 80, but 30 by 80 is what it says. 30 by 50. That's, that's smaller than, that's quite a bit smaller than the campground. Yeah, that's just a campground. Right. And even the 50 by the 50 by 80 was the home, correct? No. You said you have about half of the lots. The 30 by 50 is for the camp for the campsites. What was the 50 by 80? Maybe I misunderstood. There was something I heard that uh, right. 50, the 50 by, by 80 is what he thought it was at first, and then he looked back at the notes because he said he wasn't sure. And then it was 30 by 50 is what it's not. But when he was talking about building the houses, he said on half acre lots. Yeah, but just for a how big a home were they? That's to be determined. He's gonna put it on them being of uh, you know, like he said, around 30 by 40 or something. Is that 1250 square foot? No. Yeah, that's 1200 feet. Well 1200 square feet. 30 covenant, by 40 and is and he also up. referred to the covenants. Why didn't he put a well there? The covenant said we objected to it. He was following the covenants there. And he said the covenants are there. Well, we can't make this decision as a board for getting the county based on covenants. That's not ours to legislate. So I mean I'm not please don't take this as, as being disrespectful in any way, but we cannot enforce covenants. So if you have a problem with someone breaking your covenants, the only recourse that you have is to sue them in civil court. The only I'm not telling you to sue anyone. No, no. I'm just explaining what it is. No, and that's why the state's attorney said that covenants would not influence this board's decision. That's what the state's attorney said. Do you understand what I mean? I kind of knew that with that. Looks like it looks like uh, you folks are looking at the covenants a little bit before you have to uh, rezone some. You know. I understand your point yeah. of view, I really do, but we can't see that in consideration. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying that you aren't justifying your opinion, but legally we can't enforce covenants as long as that's the reason we all bought our homes out there. Get covered, be protected, and have a camera and come around and surround us. Well, I hope you guys think about it. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to talk? No, no, you guys have any questions? Okay, you're enough. I'm back. Yeah, you guys have any questions? Go ahead and ask me. I'll answer whatever you guys want. My name is Matt Evans. Um, I uh, uh, kind of jotted down things as they were uh, talking to answer their questions as best I could. Like I said, if there's anything that I missed, uh, just please let me know. I'll try to answer everything that I can. Um, so, as far as the lot sizes, what Neil was talking about, it is the notated that I have in your guys' packet on there for the size. Uh, I was mistaken. I had the first lot size on there. Um, uh, so uh, one thing that they were, um, uh, so which which one is the, the measure?
measuring of the property that this one. Okay, so uh, a couple of people said that I only had eight acres total out of everything. And just this section here, if you measure it, uh, according to Beacon, and I even did miss a sliver of it, is 6.7 acres, as I stated uh, before when I talked. Um, so it's pretty close. When I measured it before, it was like really, really close to seven acres, depending on how you measured it. So now I'll measure the south side also so we can get an accurate measurement of uh, how the property is on the south side because they were concerned that there wasn't enough room and acres on that side. I'll measure that. Mr. Kelty, if you look at that white line, that's the average water mark. So there's still moist soil. See how the white line comes up against bob chops there on the middle? That's nothing but moist. Which, which white line? I'm sorry. What's the third? The blue. I was there yesterday. This white line right here, that is nothing but reeds and moist soil. Okay. And it was water two months ago. Okay, so uh, I understand where he's coming from. Uh, like I said, I will be doing their work. Uh, there is tons and tons of soil here to level this out. All of this will be leveled out in here to make this what it needs to be. Um, even if not, I will bring in dirt to uh, make what needs to be acceptable for septic systems and lot size uh, to make sure that things are not packed in. Um, I don't remember which point were you saying, Matt? Uh, you said it was 30 feet or something. You so, shot in a range. So, so if you walk the property, you have about a driveway's worth coming along this edge. Okay. And a driveway's worth coming along this edge. Okay. You have approximately, from the high water mark, you have approximately 4.64 acres right here. Okay. This 60 yards from right here right here is nothing but reeds and wetland at this moment right now. Two months ago it was water and when I worked at the golf course and we disturbed dirt, we had to build a barrier that would not let soil go into a lake. So this needs a bridge. This little triangle right here is about a third of an acre. This triangle right here. And then once again you need another bridge here to access this third of an acre and none of this here is accessible. Correct. I have pictures on my phone for you to see that. So all 32 homes are going along this edge right 20. here. There's only 20. 20 homes along this edge right here. And then 80 campgrounds packed right in here with one road that comes right here. And all of this is classified as a national wetland. It's actually not. I actually have a map. map. I would love to see that map. So, yeah, this little cutout is Bob Chops. That does not include that there, that little cutout there. It's six acres that's Bob Chops. Correct. And he is not in favor of a well. He is not in favor of development. So, as they were talking uh, about the DNR, I have uh, from Shannon. Minrich right here on my phone from ENR approval for everything uh, as far as uh, digging out what he calls a wetland, which it is not. Um, all I need is the permit uh, to get that done, and Shannon from the DNR has approved that. All I need to do is sign the permits once this is approved. Yes, I think in, we provided this picture, which shows that this green area here is the wetland. And if you, all of this that is still green is marsh. And so you have a driveway, a driveway to access this peninsula, 
A bridge or driveway next to a lake to access a third of an acre, and a bridge or an axe, uh, still there to access. And this soil that he's talking about is so abundant, came from the bottom of Lake West. So I doubt that this is suitable for building. Is that a man made lake? Yes. It was an old strip. Well, that was for the. Uh, yeah, so there are springs right here that make the lake on this side. Um, and I understand uh, Matt Ramsey's confusion now that he's talking as far as the wetland. There is a wetland there, but it is not considered a wetland by the ENR because it is zoned R2. In order to be an actual wetland and not be able to do anything with it, you have to have ag property. So you might know something about this. Um, you have to have ag property because you get state or government assistance for having that wetland property. As R2, you do not get assistance, therefore, it's not a wetland. And that's what uh, Jen Moonrich uh, has emailed me and confirmed, and I also have confirmed through GFP. I'm sorry, there's like four different ones. All of the other government facilities and asked them if they had uh, any jurisdiction over it and BNR was the only one. And I have uh, written permission on my phone from them, as long as I do the permits, to date all of that out and build there. That would be a good thing to see those documents. Yeah, I got them right here. Well, yeah. the, as far as well, it's just like being part of the farm program, you can drain any wetland with the new orphan drug. Yeah, you can't be in the farm program. Correct. 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 Uh, as far as that goes, DNR has very strict rules as far as that goes. I would also like to continue measuring, if I could, uh, that whole uh, part of the lake there. Uh, it might take a little bit of time to stop it all. So as he said, as I go beyond this point, there there is not enough shoreline to me to for me to mess with anything beyond here. Um, I don't believe it's suitable to build beyond this uh, measurement point. I'll just swing back. Twelve point seven eight. I believe I stated earlier uh, that it was fourteen. If I remember right, it depends on how you measure it. Like each centimeter really makes a difference as far as it goes. But uh, right around the thirteen to fourteen acres is what I came up with. I believe what was stated earlier from other people was eight acres total. So uh, I believe the corrected would be anywhere from uh, nineteen to twenty-one acres total of land. The next, uh, let's see here. So I did the lot size. Um, I heard from some of you. Was it uh, eight 
you and I was just going to take the trees that you said. Yeah, if you were going to do one acre lots, the commission said in 2003. Okay. And that's what they, if you were doing houses. Okay. So, as it, as it sits now. So, if I did just R2 right now with the seven acres, we have seven houses on the one side instead of 12, so there'd be five extra. Um, and that's if I did it on land only. If I did, uh, like I was talking earlier with the half acre of water and half acre of land, uh, which I was told I could do, we could fit another three to four houses on there. So you're talking maybe one to two extra houses just on that six acres by where you live. And then we're doing 20 houses on the south side. So that would be seven extra or six extra houses on the south side. And that's also, again, if I do uh, only land on that side. You have to remember, Utica has 30 some houses less than 28 acres. So. Correct. And that's what I'm trying to change here. I would really like to uh, make the development. I, I believe Utica has not been developed for a, a lot of years. And I really think that. If you, uh, yeah, if, you had, if you had a nice home out there, would you want a campground beside you? So, you know, I, proof. I agree. I, I, I but you told us you were going to build your own house. I want to start. I can speak. I'm sorry. I would like to. I would like to answer Neil's question. Um, I think it's a good one. Um, when I first, I actually talked to Neil first. Um, yeah, you talk. You talked to me. Came out and said. We didn't do this and this and this. Yeah. We didn't enforce the cover. So okay, so that was your re reaction right away. First time you saw it. I'd like to answer Neil's question. Um, Neil is uh, basically stating with the covenants being in place that um, would I want that built where I'm at? Honestly, I'm going to have a place out there. I want to have a place out there. Kurt Oliver went to his place because it's beautiful, it's a nice place, it's right on the lake. I grew up on this place. I want to live out there. And even if I didn't want to live out there for some reason, uh, Neil, first of all, as far as covenants go, you actually have, you're building an RV park right now. And there is on your deed, it says right on your deed that you cannot use your RV, you cannot use your land that you're on right now for an RV park. And you're building one right now. It's not an RV park till it's done. Okay, all right, no more discussion. It's not an RV park till it's done. So basically, um, I I paid a lot of money uh, for a stipulation on that land, and it's still getting built, and I let that happen. And then the the the, the part of Neil saying that. He doesn't want to live at a place and look out the window and see an RV park. I've done my best to do houses. You won't even be able to see the campers. Um, I've talked to these guys as much as I possibly could to uh, work as a team and make this a beautiful place. I believe, uh, Neil, I really think that you're being uh, hypocritical. You actually live at your RV park. So for you to say that you don't want to look out your window and see an RV park, that's kind of tough. But I just okay, sorry. I just wanted to answer his question. Um, I'll move on. Uh, background checks, uh, Mr. Arns. Uh, I actually do uh, background checks on all of my uh, rental applications um, where that does not happen. I do not allow any of that at any of my uh, establishments. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, you're also, you have uh, with your with your property, people backing in with boats when they're not supposed to off of that road that is completely uncalled for. Um, there actually are signs uh, and buoys that I have uh, purchased from GMP specifically. Uh, for Section 5 lakes to not allow any public on uh, a lake water, and they, they won't be able to back in from that road uh, anymore. So there will be signs and buoys to where they will not come onto your property 
and they don't know they can't fish or uh, be able to access it from that road. Um, uh, the septic tanks was a question also with the 3,000 gallon tanks. I've built multiple septic systems or helped with uh, look right construction. Um, we are up to code as far as that goes with the South Dakota Plumbing Commission. It is all uh, approved uh, as far as when they do their construction. Uh, if anything changes, it all gets approved by the uh, uh, Plumbing Commission before anything is covered up. Uh, look right construction has been in business for a long time and they're very professional. Um, they, they know what rules are in place to make it a safe septic system. Um, as far as uh, the things that they're saying, as far as not fitting, uh, some, some things were said with, with the range finder. Uh, certain distances will not work out. That's the reason why I made that map of Matt Rumsey's house and put it on that whole south side of the lake. To, it is the exact size of his house. It's not enlarged or shrank down. It is perfectly to the size and put on the land um, to show that there's plenty of room uh, for the houses and an extra measured out uh, three to four acres, uh, at least on the other side for the uh, campsite. And then probably one acre on the far east little sliver of campground site. Culverts, uh, so right now it, it is a little hilly out there, but there will be uh, a slope of drainage toward the lake as far as it goes. Um, I don't remember. It's like a tenth or something like that. One tenth of a foot, something like that, where uh, it has to be graded to make drainage. I don't remember exactly what the spec is from the county, but it will make drainage to the lake. Um, there will be no need for culverts. I don't have, other than the road ditches at my other establishments, I do not have uh, any culverts needed on uh, any of my roads that I have at my other um, places. Um, the selling of the sites, uh, I'm, I'm not selling any lots out here. I'll be keeping everything. Uh, there won't be actual half acre lots lotted out and plotted on here. I will keep the property and lease it out. Um, so uh, just so there's no confusion, I'm, I'm not selling any of these. Uh, did I, I don't know if I missed any other questions uh, that anybody had. That's all I have written down my notes. So I, I do have a question for you. You're saying you're not going to sell any of these. So if you're heir and decide to, then they'll have to come in and get a plan it out. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. You know, so so if you're heirs, if, you know, down the road, so I, I only look 50 years or 20 years down the road. So your heirs, what will they do with this if they don't want, want to keep this? They can sell the whole, the property as a whole. And just as Kurt Oliver, with all, he has 70 or 80 homes on his, he'll never lotted out to those houses. He'll sell the whole, uh, his is the camp I guess. I would say in my, I would sell my whole plan unit development as a whole or my child uh, would sell it as a whole. It would never be lotted out. You know, we could make that. I think that's the that's the whole point of why you're doing a plan unit development as opposed to just coming in and you could follow the zoning ordinance and carve out half acre lots all over there and wouldn't even need to you know, really need to come in for a flat, but it's a really use to do that. Correct. And you wouldn't even need to get a I was just advised, uh, you know, by other people to do a plan unit development, I guess is, is how I was told. You know, and I know these covenants, we have no, they have no jurisdiction over the county. Um, but so, 
how good is it for either of these people to buy this property with this covenant? Why doesn't it go with them for life? And, 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 and that's a, a, so a loaded question, but it's very unfair as far as I'm concerned. I, I would like to answer that. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, the covenants that are out there, like I said, are uh, null and void for multiple reasons. One, because the owner, imagine if you were the owner. I understand that part, so you don't have to reach like that. Uh, but I just, uh, you don't think it's fair. So I don't. Neil Wang was actually just granted uh, his conditional use for his campground. And then there is a covenant on his property right on his deed that says he cannot build a campground on that property and use it as a campground. Well, he got a use permit from you guys uh, to build a campground there. Well, I paid $350,000 for uh, that specific restriction on that property, and he's building it right now. And that's another reason why there's so much heated argument here because there's a lot of lines. Just, just to address the covenants issue, and I, I don't disagree. If I, if I bought one of those holds with the understanding that, that I had this covenant on there or any covenants, and it turned out whatever the issue is to not be, I would be upset too. But um, regarding any covenant, the county has no bearing on it. There's a lot of developments that have a certain number of pitch, certain number of pitches, slope, no, whatever, and, and we don't. We do not need it. No, no, I, I don't. Yeah, I, I honestly, when the covenants even got brought up, I feel like it would be something irrelevant that got brought up in a court case over and over and over. Uh, and that was said, but it's still irrelevant. Um, it, I feel like now it is having a bearing, just talking about it. Um, I don't believe the covenants should have even been able to be submitted, in my opinion, but it's too late now. So. I would invite all of you, if you like, you can come sit on my deck and see this firsthand. It's a different picture when you look at it firsthand. You guys are welcome. Do you have any other questions for Matt? I was just wondering um, if you, I guess I didn't hear it, if you addressed any of the issues with the water that enters the lake now. Apparently, there's like a blue line that comes near there that really drains into there. Also, on property from the west. Is that on? Through there, the water I recollect is just over top of the county road there going into the lake of Texas. And if you're talking about maintaining a high water level, then that issue that you have to address. And then also water from water from the south also travels into there, which on the development shows how it's being built across that. Okay, so with with those lines, uh, as I stated earlier, the uh, the lake level that it was at in order to make those lines and to drain off of there is about 18 feet deep total. Right now, the lake is uh, about 12 feet, I'd say, 11 to 12 foot deep. And when I talk to them. Uh, two months ago, maybe three months ago, uh, the lake level, I have an auto chart on my uh, boat. I charted out the entire lake. The lake level uh, depth was at 14 feet. I asked uh, them if they had any issues at 14 feet as far as basement flooding, crop flooding, uh, any runoff like you're explaining. Um, and there was no issues uh, from the text message that I got told me there was no issues, but they were still not going to let me put the well in. Um, so that uh, level at 14 foot would be safe if we maintain that level. Um, what point, point of reference, this picture is at about five Sir, if you want to talk, to let you talk to your side about the service. Would I be able to ask them a question quickly? Is that okay? I would just like to. Uh, so, um, 
at 14 feet when I, I don't remember, was that two, two, three months ago when I talked to you guys? Um, was there any issues in crops or your lands uh, out there at 14 foot? Actually, it's at about 13 feet. It's water in, water out. And it maintained okay. 13 feet for about a year and a half. This picture right here, okay, we're out of five have, feet. I'm going to come on the picture though. At that level, three months ago, was everything okay? Uh, Bill Tacky is very, Bill and Tom Tacky are both very, very concerned that that late. I'm sorry, that's not this the question I'm asking. Yeah, I'm I was answering your question. Okay. I was yes, answering yes. your question yes, is yes, they were very concerned that if another inch came in, water would be in Bill Tacky's backyard. I agree completely. But at that 14 foot when I talked to you, it was okay, correct? And I answered, yes. Bill so Tacky yes. was concerned so that I was, not, if that 14 foot was okay, I wouldn't go an inch more than 14 foot. I don't even care if it's 13 foot. I can drop it down a foot. It's fine. Just as long as the lake levels are okay by all of the outdoor people and I'm not flooding anybody out. If I do that, I'm going to get sued. I, I don't want that to happen. I want the lake, lake levels to maintain the level and not dry out. As he stated, this was years and years ago, he's, I've stated, or he's, there's been statements made that the lake has been very, very low well at some times, uh, almost dry, because the lake levels have not made, been maintained for the last 24 years. I would really like to put a well in there and maintain a safe level for all of the people that are surrounding, uh, not flooding out anybody's crops, homes, etc. That that is my goal. For what what looking addresses the water that's flowing into there, you show the development cutting off natural drainage going into that we're irrigated dressing the thing out of the foundation that is in the So there is no water coming in there right now. I actually uh, have a culvert there right now with a driveway and uh, that was all approved by uh, Jameson County uh, with uh, Mike, Mike Solacek. I've been working with him as far as drainage and stuff, how that goes. I put a, a fairly large 24 inch culvert, 60 feet long, I think, to cover all the drainage. Um, and there is, there's no water coming in there as far as the, where the development would go. Um, at that time, that there won't be any blockage as far as bringing in any uh, drainage for for water. It won't block any drainage or uh, incoming water at the same time. And how do you, I guess, accommodate, like, say, say the low area on the south side here that something that naturally flows into the lake? Like right here. Yes. Okay. And there is flooding, and you show development across there, and then also how would you accommodate the water that's going right up against the town road when there's already flooding problems with the water going across the road? Do you want to maintain higher water levels? I don't want to maintain higher water levels. I want to maintain the current water levels, which I would believe for this year to be extremely low. We've been dry for two, three months. So I, if we maintain the current water level, even at the low spot right now, um, there will be no flooding over the road uh, as far as 435 goes or 305. And then I've actually talked to Bob Chop. Uh, he does want uh, some drainage on this side over here, and he wanted to make sure that I don't block that off. My development actually ends right here. Uh, it does not go past that. Well, why, don't we, why don't we mix the last house there? Because I think it would be a good thing to do. Would that be okay with you? If you, if you just, yeah, you just, because I think what you're saying is, I can't get that. Yeah. So, Maybe go from six to five there or four to six. I can ship out to I, I did talk to, to Bob already about drainage and stuff. I was actually talking to him about purchasing that property. He did not want to sell it, um, but he did want to make sure that I took care of drainage. He was okay with me uh, trimming some of the trees. Uh, 
actually hurting his crop and, um, and maintaining uh, a good order for him as far as his good crops and uh, drainage. So I don't affect him in any way. I've also talked to him about uh, uh, soybean dust and when he's doing all of his crops, he doesn't want to have an issue there. Um, I said I have already have uh, parks that are next to that uh, crops and stuff. I have no issues with that. I won't be a problem. I won't do any When, it, when the spray goes over into his property or his goes into mine, um, yeah. spray drift, um, I've talked to him about all of that. I have no issues with that. I won't be spreading his crops uh, to take care of that. I've talked to him numerous times about this uh, to make sure that he is okay with everything uh, both ways. I, I really like to keep a good neighbor and I don't want to. So the society has to make both with all the other landowners as well. I when did we ever require that? I honestly, I would have no problem. Honestly, I I have no problem. I, I like things on paper that way. Everybody is in agreement uh, and everybody's on the same page. I mean, if there's anything that I can do. Uh, to make this what they want, or a, a place like they want to be in the outdoors, like they were saying, and they want to live in a place like that. I want that too. I don't want a commercialized place like Lewis and Clark Lake. Uh, I want something of my own. But if I go out on the lake, there's hundreds of boats that I have to deal with when I'm fishing. I don't have to deal with that here. I can actually control how many people are on the lake. It's my lake. You know, if right now there's rules saying only one speedboat can be out there, and uh, you know, a couple kayaks or whatever, as long as they're non-weight forming, I have no problem with that. Uh, I mean, if whatever it takes to to make people happy, I have no problem uh, getting to that point. If it takes more trees or uh, you know something to make it more pleasing to them, I have no problem as long as it's you know legitimate. It really concerns me when you keep saying it's your lake when there's two other people that do all the land in the lake. Part of it, yes, I, I agree. They own part of the the, sh the store, the short term. I was going to ask you about boats and you brought it up. I know the covenants which is disputed, but that has the one power boat. I mean, do you have intentions of? This is more outdoors for me. I'm not a skier. I'm a fisherman. There's a lot of fish in that lake. I know Matt Rummy is a big fisherman also. Um, I would like to put more great fish into that lake. I want my kids to grow up on that lake. I want you know everybody to have a feeling of their own of outdoors, not Lewis and Clark Lake where there's waves everywhere. You know, just some John boats out there fishing, you know, having a good time. If we have to have a limit on uh, how many boats are out there, then so be it. I mean, I don't want it to be happening. And as far as traffic and everything goes out there, uh, these might be lake area homes that these people lease, but they're only there, if I had to guess on my other ones, they're not there every week, that's for sure. Once a month, maybe. Twice a month, and if I had to guess, uh, it's like Kurt Oliver's place. From what I've heard, he sold almost all of those out there, but I live right next door to it, and there's 10 cars there a weekend, 20 cars uh, out of all of it, and he has 80 in eight acres. We're talking about 21 acres in a 56 acre total, and I mean, I feel that the map that I presented is plenty spread out. Um, the south side of the lake is completely separate from the home, so it won't have any traffic there on any of their houses. Um, that's why I put just houses right next to their houses. You know, I felt like that was a fair negotiation. Okay, uh, we're just going to keep houses here, and, and they won't be packed together. Um, as far as the uh, uh, acres, uh, I know that it was three zoning, but like Rumsey's, it's point. Seven acres, you know, it's less than an acre 
and then there's another little sliver that's like a point two on it also. So I just figured that a half acre, I live on a half acre, and I feel like that's a great size um, with plenty of room to stay. Okay. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, no, I'll, I'll ask if someone else wants to speak. Okay. I, I really want to thank you guys um, for everything. This is uh, just something that I grew up on as a child, and this is my dream. I do want to be at this place and have uh, a vacation home of myself. Uh, for myself, for my kids, to fish on this lake. Very, uh, uh, an outdoors place to be, not crowded. And uh, it, is a, it is my dream. And I just want you guys' help as far as making my dream. Okay. Um, I'm going to let someone else in the audience speak. Right. And wrap up as a board, no more coffee back. <laughs> the only thing I wanted to point is that he said he could get Bob Chapman to sign off on this. Bob has signed the opposition, and you guys have a copy of it. That's all I want to do. All right, thank you. Anybody else have any comments before we close public? I'm Jerry Shapiro. Uh, four and a half years ago, my wife and I were looking to retire. And for the last 30 years, we can't live here. This is our second home. Now that I'm retired, this is my home. Uh, we spent probably two weekends going around to various locations to see where we want to live. Uh, one that stood out to us the most was Rapids. Uh, been here for two and a half years. Uh, I managed that part for Matt. It was very clean, well kept up. Uh, had decent rules in place, <coughs> so that's where we're at. And I enjoy working with Matt because between him and I and his other campers, we come up with ideas. We discuss them, figure out which is the best, always looking for improvements. And, uh, I'm hoping to have all those houses when you get down. That's that's my goal. I want to be on the way. So I just want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Time for public input is now closed. Do you have any more discussion from the board? Motion. Generally, in these cases, we, we leave it up to the applicant. We give them options of, of what they might want to do with the property, and this is the option that Mr. Evans chose. So, so uh, you can move forward accordingly. <coughs> Gary, you don't feel it's a spot zoning in any way to change this? No, PUDs you have all over the county. You've never had any those in any specific spot. It just depends on what they're trying to do. PUD essentially is spot zoning. Yeah. 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 That's, that's the point of contention. Yeah. 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 For it, I mean, just where are we? Are we at one? Yes. One way I look at this, you know, covenants aside, one way I look at this would be if it wasn't a PUD, if it was just an R2, he could have, and it, it would be fewer homes, but he could slot out that northwest corner and sell homes, and then he could put a campground in front of the <coughs> Allowed in order to so under current zoning, to me, what he wants to do is almost there. He wants PUD to be able to put it in 
we're all in for one. And, and um, we could really put, if we wanted to do that, we put a lot more campgrounds on the south. I just, I mean, I understand some of the concerns. I just wanted to put that into kind of what a PUD is for, like we talked earlier, but uh, uh, turn all over it probably should have been a PUD. So you've got multiple uses in there. You've got that the shed with storage and the part which really didn't fit any, not a campground, which is allowed in that zone. It really doesn't fit a specific thing, and there's multi uses within that. So that really should have been probably my opinion. <clears throat> That's how I see these, the use for like, why do we zone some of these? I think there's some housing development there. That they might actually want different size lines than like the state R1 district, and they might even want larger lines um, and have some different houses. They don't have to be used. But when they talk about all these different you know, they're not going to have only so many bubbles on the lake, whatever, who doesn't lose all that? You still got it. It's going to have to have some kind of color. It's not that it's at any of our business. That would be in the delivery room. It's kind of like, it's not mobile homes, but you need that clear. But it's kind of like a mobile home for that you have a lease agreement, and anybody that lives on your property, which is only entire property, they have to abide by conditions of that lease, or they can be a Now, you can't evict somebody that owns their house, so I'm really not <laughs> sure how they're going to deal with that, but that's not my problem. That's your problem. Yeah, but yeah. I'm just giving you a point of reference. Here's something. Yeah. They're not going to develop their potential in the zone area. It says in the house in the middle. But the only reason that this is classified as an R2 is that it's four homes. Am I right or wrong? I mean, it's in, it's in it's an ag district. The only reason that those were there. My guess is. Uh, I would have to say that. It was at the time. Yeah. Yeah. The plan was always. To... I almost would say it should have been a few. Uh, that right. their attention was that we got private way use and, and all of that probably would be one. So it, it sounded you know, like this sort of ended up being almost like a random building being there. You know, like it's going to be mutually shared. The piece in the corner up there, I mean, so six acres or seven acres. Some legitimate concerns. Um, 
concerns. Um, I think Alpha has a legitimate concern purchasing this property with the options to do this. Our ordinance affords him to either do PD or affords him to campground or affords him to subdivide these lots and build homes. And so I just see the in the long run where it's all going to go. For me, if you need a clean path, I guess. And again, the covenant, you know, the rest of it is, is kind of outside of our scope. But I don't know what we have to say in anything regarding that. If we, if we stick strictly to our ordinance, uh, I, I think I think you have the right to just use it as a, as a way to Any other discussion before we vote? I will just add, because I know we'll kind of discuss it. I would, I would say if this was still all egg zone land, uh, it might be different. I would probably have a different take on it, but because it, it was owned R2 with the intent of some development for the private lake, um, I think it fits the intention of that zone. Um, I know maybe some of the people who purchased homes around there uh, might not have, you know, imagine what the next campground, but again, I don't know. That. That's, that's what covenants are for. If, if there's something wrong with that covenant, I guess that's not the, the how we place to be if it's important to them as a CP. Any additional discussion? No call vote. Okay. I'm still Yeah, 
Well, the physical, he's got a hollow, he's got a hollow, right through it. I mean, in that corner, you can see the blue light on the map. You can see that blue light, you can see the water coming. Go right there, and that's not actually a blue light. Yeah, wouldn't it still, wouldn't it feed into where the, the, that marsh that could be a dug out? Right, where you want to put that road right here. Right here, 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 right I would look, it looked to me like it was going to be the oh, north of there a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Oh, it to the south, it looks like I'm along the street. I don't know. I, I don't see how you can prove this without some kind of. Uh, I'm fairly used to have a lot of regular stories, but I've never had that. I just don't hear you. Right now, I'm just voting on the research. Do you have any advice for us on the Tulare Tiger? No, that's correct, but you can certainly stipulate that, that uh, and I believe Mr. Evans already talked about he had his E and R approval already on his phone. So where is that? Is that where you put the folder? Okay, so if you look at the blue line, my driveway is half. So from the blue line to the fence line, my driveway is half of that, probably a little bit less maybe even, it's 60 feet total of culvert. So you have like uh, 10 to 15 feet of culvert past the, the fence line there um, into the easement. And then another 10 feet of open culvert on the other side with the road going through. The drainage goes to the north side. If you look, see that blue line jogs and then goes over. The drainage goes to the north side of the culvert and then into that uh, marsh that I will be digging out. So if anything, I'm clearing out uh, drainage to come uh, into the lake, which is, like I said, I do have it on my phone. If you wanna uh, have that uh, pending approval by DNR or whatever, I can give you the letter uh, from Shannon showing that I have approval to dig all of that out as soon as the permit's signed. Uh, to do all that, she said that's no problem to yeah. dig and clean I'm all of that out. Yeah, and this. I don't mind digging the marsh. I do want to make sure the water is not that blue line. Yeah. Oh. Now it's and just to be clear, uh, I'm not changing anything. I'm putting it back to how it was. That used to be all dug out over there, and there was no issues for years other than. It's silting in and reads. So, amend my motion to um, have that contingent on the DNR and approving the blue line. And so, then the DNR says no, then contingent on the approval. I have another question, maybe it's scary or just good to answer. Um, how old is this picture? I'm trying to get an idea of where the water is at now. I haven't been by there. That's the water. I've seen. I'll show you the current uh, release yet. <laughs> it's coming. This is this year. It's a permanent water. So that shows that we have the water in the ditch connecting into the lake. This is pretty good. I think we grew very equal. Yeah, exactly. I don't agree the one that a top of the water should sit down in the county ditch anymore. It's just <laughs> what, what, is, what is the water water level at this point? It was about 14 feet for what? Correct. So this is 15 feet well, the water in the ditch. So you're going to maintain 14 feet. You're going to maintain 14 feet. 
that up what the compensation for and then it's going to be an addition. Well, D and R should check on that. I mean, looking at the picture, it looks like there's water on the west side of the bridge. I mean, that was going to be every spring that gets saturated. I'm going to say, I've been out there taking pictures. Both sides of the road. Both sides of the road. When I was a kid, and I remember that was all dug out, there was water right up there. So, you know, there's a lot of I'm just concerned that if we're going to keep the water level high as a mess, even though you're going to have a dug out again, it's full, are we going to create more of a problem here than we already have? Well, his water level is going to be less than what it is now. It's just 15 feet and 15 feet. It's going to be less than that. Well, now the picture is taking that picture. They're going to take water out of there. Well, I think the, 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 the point with the well is that we're not going to run the well. But there was a well. There is a well. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Next item on the agenda. Yes, it's going to be a long one. I've been a great one. Right. Test, test. Carrie, we can hear you. If you want to just stay on mute until it's your turn to speak. Sounds great. Thank you.
Next item on the agenda. Lasitel AT&T conditional use permit. Applicant is requesting a conditional use permit for a communications tower. Said property is legally described as Bison's Track 4 and platted in book S10. Page 22, accepting therefrom, legally described as Bison's Track 4 as platted in book S10. Page 22, excuse me, accepting therefrom the east 590.30 feet of the south 590.30 feet of the Bison's Tract 4 as shown on survey, located in the north path and accepting the east 590.30 feet of the north 590.30 feet of section 12, T93 North, Range 57 West of the 5th PM, Yankton County, South Dakota. Less highways and roads here and after referred to as Ziscop, South Township, County of Yankton, State of South Dakota. The E911 address is 398 Wildflower Road, Yankton, South Dakota. And uh, chair? Yes. Uh, Phil Van Camp, I'm a. Red usually means stop. <laughs> Phil Van Camp, I'm a lawyer um, for Peer, uh, representing ATP. Um, I was not before this commission uh, in the previous hearings. My understanding had five and a half hours of testimony already. So my job is to be as succinct as possible and to be very quick because the hour is late. Uh, as this commission is aware, um, this tower has been requested by AT&T due to uh, the large area near Lewis and Clark in the recreational area that needs to serve that now currently does not have good cellular connectivity uh, in your packets. As was uh, submitted before and as has been supplemented, we have filed a radio frequency statement explaining the coverage gap that currently exists for AT&T customers. We have supplied, again, alternative site analysis with updated uh, sites and uh, further requests of the last few uh, commission meetings to include additional sites. I have with me today from AT&T, Jim Tidmore in the back there. Uh, and Ryan Strat from Powder River. If there are questions on those submissions, they're the ones that will be able to answer that and the radio frequency statement itself. Um, Cheryl Riley from AT&T is here. She spoke at the last meeting on the need of this site as it is part of the state's build up for the first net project. I think Carrie Johnson will be on the line after I'm done, uh, who will address um, the first net need in this community uh, and her work for AT&T and first net. Um, as a precursor, I, I don't want to rehash what has already been discussed, but as this commission is aware, um, the county cannot regulate radio frequency emissions. It is precluded from considering that. Um, we have submitted previously that we meet FCC regulations, and as such, um, the county cannot consider in its siting determination here the health concerns for radio uh, frequency emissions, nor can the committee consider as a proxy for those issues, other invalid uh, arguments such as aesthetics or property values. Um, relating to property values, since that was brought up in the last commission meeting, uh, with me today is Josh Luther from CBRE out of Sioux Falls. And if the commission has questions or if the questions do arise from the, um, the community members about the valuations, Josh is here to address that issue. Now the county can only deny, as they know, as this board knows, uh, the request based on substantial evidence. Um, specific reasons consistent with local regulations and supported by substantial evidence are necessary in the record to deny the application. This county's own consultant found, and I know this commission has heard this, but I'm going to state it again, that it would, hard to be, it would be hard to defend the denial of conditional use permit missing instance and not run afoul of the current interpretation of U.S. Code. 
a modern interpretation, and I'm quoting directly from your consultant, would seemingly prohibit the reason for denial would be if someone could see the site from their property, a common claim of land evaluation, or an opinion there is a better location for the site and general neighborhood opposition. While I understand the neighbor's concerns, and I understand they have a right to appear and object, the FCC is quite clear that if we need the determinations and if we have laid out for this commission that there is a, uh, a coverage gap and that we have taken the um, necessary tests and met the standards for at least intrusive means and submitting our application as I would submit that we have, that the county must under current federal rules uh, approve the permit. The burden in fact shifts to the county to deny the permit if we have demonstrated at least, at least intrusive means in selecting our location and we have provided the county with significant coverage gap um, evidence, which I feel that we have. Um, you are aware of the coverage gap um, from previous meetings, um, and so I don't feel I need to restate that. I, I, I have been told in the previous meeting the condition, uh, the, the, the issues concerning the road were brought up. Uh, we address that in our submission. Um, there is a private road that runs to the property that the landlord has a right to access. We certainly have the right uh, under the lease agreement to access the property in the same manner. I would not argue that we have a right to place facilities under the road on a private road without the consent of the neighboring land uh, owners or if there was a sufficient uh, record found in the title um, that allowed us to do that. But 310th Street is a uh, section line highway that is a quarter mile from the property uh, of the landlord. And so certainly we have an access right there uh, and we have a right to run facilities uh, upon a GOT application. Um, for the placing of telecommunication facilities under that section line highway. Lastly, I'll point out um, that MIDCO has, um, this is rather unusual, has allowed us to state that we are, that they will be building two miles of fiber to the site. Um, that improves rural broadband deployment in Yankton County. I know that's been a big push of the current administration. Uh, and it's been a big push federally to reach out into rural areas and improve broadband access. Uh, we've all seen with COVID uh, what's been necessary um, to work and study or go to school from our homes and in uh, rural areas that's been difficult to pass. With that, uh, if Carrie Johnson's on the phone, she could speak. I'll be available for any questions and the individuals who we have with the team based on the questions that were at the last um, commission meeting are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Well, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today um, as the uh, part of the applicant team. My name is Carrie Johnson. Um, I serve as the Director of Strategy and Policy for the FirstNet program at AT&T. Um, one of my here is a focus is our first net deployment and improving connectivity in rural and tribal areas across the country. Um, I grew up in Yankton and uh, graduated from YHS in 2005. Um, so I, I am quite familiar uh, with Yankton County. Uh, the proposed tower site that we're, we're here talking to you uh, today uh, regarding is part of our, our nationwide first net build out. My colleague, Cheryl Riley, I understand, um, provided some additional background about first net uh, at, at the last meeting. So I'll try to stay, stay brief. Uh, but just as, as a bit of background, um, back in 2017, AT&T was selected by the Federal First Net Authority to be the private partner to work um, in, in partnership with them to build, operate, and evolve uh, FirstNet as a, a dedicated, interoperable nationwide network for America's first responders. And as part of designing our FirstNet build, we created custom state plans based on, on feedback that had been received from state as well as public safety stakeholders. Um, and, and one of those plans for South Dakota um, uh, was reviewed um, by the state of South Dakota um, they then were able to share their own direct input based on feedback from public safety stakeholders on where there was a, a need for improved connectivity. 
and Yankton County was one of those locations that was identified as a, a recognized area where there is um, a, a need for public safety to have improved connectivity. Um, so this hour that we are, are here to discuss today um, will improve connectivity for first responders on FirstNet, um, but then there are also broader benefits for the community in Yankton County. Um, uh, you know, definitely for, for AT&T commercial customers seeing an improvement in their own coverage and capacity, but then just like uh, Bill shared, um, we get permission from MITCO to share that they are going to be um, doing a, a 2.3 mile fiber build that, that will improve their own feasibility to, to extend the reach of, of their residential internet service. Additionally, we designed the tower um, to be a, a multi-carrier site to support other carriers. So it's entirely possible we could see further um, co-location as a result um, of, of this, this proposed tower site. Um, in growing up uh, in Yankton County, um, I can and personal attest to, to the need um, for improved coverage in the county. Um, most recently, I, I was back home. My, my folks still um, live in the county on Highway 52. Uh, just past Gavin's Point, <clears throat> and I was attempting to try and, and work uh, work remotely, um, and and tried to power up a, a mobile hotspot. First attempted it on my my AT&T device, then a FirstNet device, and then actually um, needed to resort to using one of my my parents' devices that, that they're on a, a different carrier, and and on on none of those options that I have uh, the the needed you know coverage and capacity to power up that hotspot. It required me going into town uh, to be able to, to do that work, which was, was you know, highly disruptive um, um, uh, and, and not, certainly not, um, you know, an effective way to try to, to work remotely. Um, and we, we heard similar feedback and in your, your packets today, um, you will see um, local stakeholders weighing in about the difficulty that the lack of connectivity in Yankton County poses to their day-to-day -day lives. Um, you know, this has become all the more pressing uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, one of the individuals who wrote in was Terry Tennant, so a business leader in town, also um, someone who lives uh, near the proposed tower site. And, and he shared just the difficulty for his own family um, specifically as kids trying to, to do school um, from home. He has, has a kid in college, kid in high school, um, and the difficulty last spring as they were trying to be able to continue their studies uh, with the limited internet options and connectivity options um, that they have in their home. That's why you know, he has, has voice support for this project. He was joined um, by other neighbors, other Yankton County residents who similarly um, highlighted the need for improved connectivity for economic development. Again, the ability to work from home, go to school from home, um, general quality of life. We also heard um, from, from uh, those with, with knowledge of real estate who, who have actually lost home sales and heard directly um, from those looking to, to buy and, and relocate to the county, um, but that connectivity is a real, real barrier. Um, other folks who, who weighed in, um, in addition to other business and, and, and community residents, we heard from uh, Casey Haberman with the Yankton Convention, Convention and Visitors Bureau who highlighted the real need for, for improved connectivity near the lake um, to be able to, to support economic development and visitors who, who come to Yankton County. Um, but most, most critical and concerning is, is, is the need for connectivity for first responders um, as well as, as the broader public during emergency situations. Um, this tower site, again, as, as we mentioned, because of the first net build and, and as a recognized um, coverage need for public safety, um, will we'll certainly be filling gaps that exist in Yankton County, um, in the residential areas along Highway 52, um, as well as, as State Park. And, and again, in your, your packets um, today, um, there were community stakeholders who weighed in, um, specifically highlighting some of these emergency uh, concerns, the concern about 
um, the difficulty dialing 911 if, if there is an emergency and you're in an area with, with limited connectivity. Um, and so with that, um, really appreciate your, your consideration um, of the need for improved connectivity for the broader community, also equipping first responders um, with, with the coverage that they need to be able to uh, call for backup, access situational awareness tools and, and, and um, data, uh, enabling effective communication between um, ambulance, transporting a patient and being able to talk to medical staff. Um, these are the type of capabilities that, that are supported and, and given that, that needed priority treatment on FirstNet. Um, so greatly appreciate um, this commission's uh, review of, of our application and then also the, the feedback from local stakeholders um, who highlight the, the very real need um, for improved connectivity and the opportunity um, that this site brings to, to improve coverage for the county. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Ms. Johnson, this is Mr. Harms. Is FirstNet already in use in South Dakota? It is. It is. Um, FirstNet, so, so actually our, our adoption within South Dakota has been quite strong. South Dakota is one of our strongest states, um, and we have thousands of users um, across the state on FirstNet, um, including in Yankton County. Um, but some uh, good examples, uh, we, we just had a Senate oversight hearing uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, the Pennington County Sheriff, um, they actually testified before the Senate highlighting how um, they are using FirstNet for their day-to-day -day operations as well as, as during emergencies. Um, so we have seen very strong traction in South Dakota and already seeing, seeing the benefit of this network. Thank you. Any other board Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I assume you'll be staying on the line? Yes, I will be. Okay. Does AT&T have another rep they want to speak? No, we don't have to. All right. Is there any other discussion before I ask the public input? I do. Yes. Is that your uh, your plan person? Who's that? What's that? Is it for the alternative site allocation? Or no, I'm talking about the, the the harm, financial harm to those people who have this land. My question is this. Okay, wait, yes, just stay the same, please. Uh, my name is Josh Luther. I am a certified general real estate appraiser with the state of South Dakota. I work for CBRE based out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, AT&T says they get a 5% increase in land value where there's an antenna. That's the way I understand what they said, right? Am I wrong? What we have found nationally is that reliable wireless connectivity is a top, top consideration for home buyers and renters, and it can boost the home value okay. by 5%. I, I'm denying that. My question is is that for homeowners that have to look at the antenna? Do they get the 5%? Well, I'm going to let this one click. Okay. 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 
So uh, the statement that was made, that was not something that I specifically studied. So that's a national study that was done. So <laughs> national study had nothing to do with South Dakota. <clears throat> I haven't reviewed the study. It was a national study, so I can't answer that question. Well, that's my question. Maybe it was South Dakota taking into consideration in that study. Well, it's a national study. <laughs> You can be all the national stuff. I can discuss, I can look up things in the East Coast and the West Coast and ignore what the flyover states, which happens a lot. So I'm asking you, how many states were, were taken into consideration of this? I, I don't have to study with me. I'm sure it's about that fit. I'm sorry, but we, if Josh is here to talk about what he has found in his work in South Dakota. Okay. If that's what you want to hear. And that's what Josh is here for. Has there been an increase? Not, I know you weren't happy with what I said last time, and that's why we need to I'm asking him. Yeah. People that look at the intent, has there been an increase of 5% in their property values? Yeah. So I, I can't make that statement. Uh, uh, you can make the statement I can, to those who get better coverage, I can, right? I can talk about the the studies that, that I did and the, the um, findings that, that, you know, um, Based on the preliminary research that we've done, so I can't I can't discuss about the national you know study because I didn't that's not wasn't part of my analysis. So I can talk about what I did here locally. It wouldn't be too local. Uh, we researched multiple parrot sales in the area that were in close proximity to uh, South Towers in Yankton County, and we also expanded our search. Uh, two other areas, so we looked at uh, uh, also another sub a rural subdivision in, in uh, Lincoln County that had a tower uh, right next to the development as well. And um, we, we also surveyed individuals and collected other technical data to... Um, uh, which, is, which individuals, did, where did you do the survey? We surveyed uh, a number of local market participants here in the Yankton area. Um, I don't have the list on me. Well, I just have to ask. Um, and in preparation for this meeting, you know, I we had to focus on the analysis piece so I could come here and try and answer questions. So I don't have a report prepared, but I am prepared to write a report, um, you know, based on our findings. Uh, to the report is just not done today. In your experience, land values where people have to look at an end, you know, has there been any effect? Well, based so each each property uh, is unique. So there, um, you know, when we talk about broad trends about what happens, it, um, just like the national survey. When we look at the raw trends, even in the Yankton area, um, the trends with the match paired cells that I'm seeing is showing um, relatively minimal impact, uh, but that doesn't reference specific properties. So um, there's a, a spectrum there that the property sales or paired sales fall in. So um, to sit here and issue an opinion on one specific property, I can't do that today. My question to at and is you have people here who have anecdotal evidence that they're going to lose money, massive amounts of money. So they're just out of luck. I'm sorry, Commissioner Bill Van Camp again. Um, I, I don't think under the applicable federal standards, one or two individuals making an anecdotal claim that they're going to have a diminution in value is reason under the existing federal rules to deny a permit. And that's just the law. It doesn't in your, in your packet, I, I, yeah, I read through all the stuff that has it, yeah, but I can't even understand it because I'm not an engineer. So it seems to me I read one part that if it is possible, that was one of the issues that we could vote no. True or false? I think that's that broad of a statement is false. Okay. Well, what should I say? You have to find substantial evidence that the location of the tower 
does not comport with the existing regulations you've created under your joint. The only is, is a financial hardship. One of the things I can take into consideration. Give me a second, Commissioner. Uh, I have your ordinances. Uh, here. I don't have your zoning ordinances in front of me there in my briefcase, but I would be glad to come back after your public comment to answer that question. Is that fair? Yeah, and, and Bill? Um, when, when, when looking at some of these site maps that we, we've received, and, and as I know I was talking and, and other people have, um, with Wayland Taylor, uh, Taylor from the Scramblers, out there at the Scramblers, they got 108 acres they actually have a site that would be quite acceptable for this. That new size, I don't see it on the list of the non acceptables or acceptable. I went through all those and I don't see that. I'm going to offer, Commissioner, I'm going to get back to your question and address yours at the same time. If you read the very report that your consultant submitted, he stated a moderate interpretation of U.S. Code would not allow you to deny, and I'm paraphrasing here, on an opinion there would be a better location for the site, which is your question to me, and a general good neighborhood opposition and a common thing of land evaluation. That's not AT&T, that's your consultant. You can disregard your consultant, that's fine. You can do it at your peril. I'm just saying what your consultant found and put it in the record. Madam Chair, yeah. before we go to the public comment, I want, guess I, want, I thought there were more speakers. I just want to bring into this meeting. Um, I had a phone discussion with Kerry Johnson uh, late last week where I had asked a few of these questions. And I think they're just to bring them to, to light today. Are you there, Carrie? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, and I, I think really there were two main ones that that I, you know, expressed concern with. One was um, the the Northwestern Energy Power site, and it looks like there's more information in the in the packet, and I I'd like AT and T, whether it's you or somebody, to kind of go through more of that history because. I felt that that uh, what was submitted originally did not meet the, the criteria. Um, you know, I, I guess I kind of expressed that the feeling that I got was that they knocked on the door, nobody answered, and they moved on. Mm. And that's what was presented. So if you can kind of elaborate on what our discussion was, and then also um, one of the other things that we talked about, I had asked in one of the meetings and never really got a, a clear response on so my, my question to you was if, it actually in the meeting prior to was if Verizon has coverage in the area, how can at and not co-locate on Verizon towers to get the same coverage? I, I believe the the indication from AT and T was that we can, we really can't prevent competition in the area that Verizon had coverage. We had to essentially by law allow competitive coverage in the area. And that was why I posed that question of of co-locating within Verizon towers. I just want to bring those. And if there's anything else we discuss, please bring it into the meeting just so everybody's aware. Open meetings. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So, so I can um, speak to, to both those points and then, and then Bill, feel free to, to weigh in further. Um, so specifically with the, the Northwest Energy site, um, that is a location that, that was um, considered, you know, any time that, that we are looking um, to deploy and specifically with, with the FirstNet project, just to kind of step back and, and provide kind of further um, grounding. So, so again, when the state of South Dakota was looking at the proposed plan um, for the first net build out in the state, they then got to, to look at the map and pinpoint, okay, we know we have coverage needs 
here, 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 and, and they they got to, to pinpoint exactly where there were a need was a need for for additional sites, and that was directly based on feedback um, from local and state public safety stakeholders. Yankton was one of those sites, and so based on on that, what we would call a dot map, um, we then then engaged our site acquisition team to go out and, and one of the things we, we look at as, as the very first pass is always looking um, if there is existing vertical infrastructure. Um, so that is something that, that we did in this, this instance. Um, with that Northwest Energy site in particular, this is something we've looked at before, um, dating back to, to 2013, 2014, um, where we had had engagements um, studying and examining that that particular location, it was deemed at that time that um, that that tower is maxed out. There there is no space for co-location on that existing site, um, and and so that um, you know presents a real challenge. Um, we then worked with Northwest Energy um, to see if we could reach agreement on. Um, either a drop and swap or a, a entirely new site, um, and we were not able to reach agreement. Um, Bill today um, shared with the county um, a letter that we got from Northwest Energy outlining that again, that their site is at capacity, um, there's no space on the existing site, um, and, and that we were not able to reach terms. So that, that was not um, a viable option. We thoroughly reviewed um, that site and and it's just not not an option for this build um, specifically with with the question about Verizon um, you know I personally um, in a different role appeared before this exact um, planning commission um, not for at t um, but but actually for for one of the other carriers that was also working to to improve um, some coverage in in the county. Um, you know, there is a need for improved vertical infrastructure, new tower infrastructure. And, and I would argue that, that really this is a challenge that, that is not limited to AT&T. Um, from the, the comments that were shared and, and the positions of support from local stakeholders, many of those highlight that they, you know, are a Verizon customer and, and they, they also suffer from from marginal coverage um, in the county, and so um, you know when we looked at the search ring, we did look at, at existing vertical infrastructure. Um, there was not vertical infrastructure that we could leverage. That's why you know we are looking to to build a new tower. Um, you know, as I noted in my my opening remarks, um, this uh, the the way that we designed the site in accordance with the county's rules. Um, was to make sure um, that it that it could support multiple carriers, and so I think one of the great opportunities um, with the site, not only expanding um, first net coverage, improving at t coverage, there, there's a, a very real possibility we could see other co-location co on the site and, and further improve connectivity down the road. Um, so, so that that would be kind of the the key piece. I think this is just an opportunity. Um, to meaningfully improve coverage in the county, which has long been recognized as a place um, that, that's desperately in need of, of um, vertical infrastructure and, and improved wireless coverage. I think, I think that's the majority of what we've talked. I just wanted to make sure it was brought into the, the conversation, I guess. Um, I think that it kind of covers it. I think I did tell you that I would be at expecting an answer or uh, finding on the, the road access, so I'm sure we'll get to do that at some point too. But that, I just wanted to bring that in. Okay. Okay. All Okay, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this issue? Um, 
Oh, I can do that. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah. My name is Lisa Huber. My husband and I live in Sundance Ridge and are the developers of Sundance Ridge Lots. Our property shares the west lot fence line with AT&T's proposed site for a cell tower. The cell tower is the right thing, but in the wrong location. It's wrong for multiple reasons. The first reason is, as a developer in this area, my husband and I have sold multiple lots. The lot owners have built beautiful homes, actively contributing to the tax base of Yankton County. We would like to continue to support Yankton's growth in this area. We have several lots for sale that are currently in contract, but holding on closure based on the decision of this tower. All of the lots are within direct visual line of sight of this tower and are as close as 400 feet from the tower. AT&T states that a tower will raise the property value by 5%, but if lots do not close, my loss is 100%. This is rock solid evidence that the tower will devalue property in the area. The second reason it's wrong is the tower is not consistent with the uses of the land in this area. The low density residential area is beautiful and it's got 360 degree views, including of the lake. According to the county zoning ordinance, 1805, 5H and 1809, D9, any proposed condition we use needs to be compatible with adjacent properties. Placing a commercial property cell tower in a residential area is not consistent with the uses of this area. As a resident in this area, I do not feel that Lakeview property is the appropriate place for a communications tower. The third reason it's not a good location is the ingress and egress to the area is not compatible with commercial property. The road to access this area is not currently county maintained. This road, including gravel, culverts, grading, has been paid for by private individuals who live in the area. They are the, also the ones who plow open the road in the winter and repair damage from the rains in the spring. The county has no involvement in maintaining the road and has no plans to maintain it in the future according to their recently approved five-year plan. Therefore, the county should not have involvement allowing a conditional use that would have commercial access to the road. In accordance with County Zoning Ordinance Section 1805, 5A, 1809, D2, and 1905-6A, identifying appropriate ingress and egress to the proposed site is necessary. There are many issues with the 310 section line, one of the biggest issues being that the road is in the wrong location. In some areas, there are fences located in the middle of the road where the section line should be located. To do this road right would require the area to be surveyed and existing infrastructure to be relocated. This would be necessary to allow the placement of the fiber optic lines in the correct location to avoid damage to these lines in the future if additional road work is or widening is indicated. The estimated cost um, for this was $400,000 per Yankton County Highway Superintendent Hi. Mike Sedlacek. This was brought up by Commissioner Dan Klimish at the last meeting. I am suggesting that if this conditional use permit is allowed, the county needs to be build the road to their specifications and bill AT&T. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, next person. Yes, I'm sorry, I did not identify the rules. We start off with five minutes per person, and then, huh? no, five. Five is what we've been doing. And we only went three. We only went three. Three? Okay. All right, all right. Well, we can do it. Let's go free, and if you didn't have a chance to finish, you can have a chance at the end. Okay? That way, everybody gets a chance to speak. Some people at an earlier bedtime. All right, thank you. Thanks, person.
Hi, my name is Ingrid Maibaum, and I currently live the closest, my home is the closest to the site property as of right now, not until the future homes are developed. Um, my biggest question is, is they keep saying that this is zoned um, agricultural, but the map is right there highlighting it as a residential. So how did they not give um, a step in your guys' ordinance with having to prove that they couldn't place this in agricultural zone area? Um, that's just one of my big questions that I don't think has been answered in any of these meetings so far. Um, I guess that's, I don't know, like, it's clearly residential. It's a conditional use permit for a hobby farm right now. Um, to state that it's agriculturally zoned would be spot zoning. Um, I guess that's where I'm questioning. So I don't, their application is completely falsified at this point, just on that condition alone. My name is Kevin Gunther, and my son is thinking of buying the lot 16 with wings. Uh, this is on condition whether this is approved or not. I guess I have two things. Conditional use permit is on this location. It's not denying them AT&T to put a tower any place we need to go. It's this location, that's what the conditional use permit. Second thing is, the last meeting, it was tabled. We told the people to go find some other areas, check them out. I didn't hear any response tonight. Um, did they check with the neighbors? I bet I could call five of those farmers. I know them all. I bet they have not been checked. We don't know. They didn't say they did. That's it. It's Todd Huber. Um, I don't have a proper, proper problem at all with at t getting better coverage, more towers. That would be great. I currently have more coverage in the area, and I agree with that. What I have a problem with is the location that they would put this tower in. Cell tower companies are supposed to select cell tower starting with the highest priority going to existing towers on county owned properties. Next priority is existing towers on non, -con, non county owned properties. Next priority is tower, a new tower on county owned properties. Fourth priority is towers on commercial property. Fifth is tower, a new tower on agricultural property. And the very last priority is tower, a new tower on residential use. Well, in this particular case, AT&T jumped right to the residential property and they selected the tribute property. AT&T says that they worked very hard and exhausted all possible locations other than the proposed site on the previous property. AT&T says they evaluated 17 sites in, in addition to the proposed site. Upon review of these 17 sites, it soon became evident that most of the evaluated sites were nonsensical locations, including Gary Dock, Car Tracks, Dam Fireworks, R&D Marine, DJ's Resort, Cottonwood Bar and Grill, Captain Norm's Dam Fireworks, Osprey Shrine. So, but in their credit, at and he did evaluate three sites that were for the further analysis. The first site is the Ned Bed site, which I'm showing on the map right here. This property is located at the northwest corner of the intersection of Highway 50 and 433. They have another property southwest corner of Highway 50 and 434 Avenue. Lloyd Ned Bed has over 300 acres of cropland located approximately half mile north of the proposed site. AT&T says this property was available, available in 2014, but is currently no longer available. I personally contacted Lloyd Medved at 92420, so just like a week or two ago, and Lloyd said that he was receptive to a cell tower at that time, but AT&T offer was too low. 
He was not interested in accepting that low bid offer. He has not been contacted by AT&T since then. That was several years ago. Um, another person that um, was, was contacted by AT&T is Cronizer. Um, he was, um, he's located approximately half mile north of the pro site and covers over 150 acres of property. He was identified in ATT's first presentation, but was not included in ATT's subsequent presentations. I talked to Dennis on 92420, and he confirmed that he was contacted by ATT several years ago, but he was never given a written or verbal offer. He has not been contacted since. Another spot that, um, let's let me pull this up. Here's the Cron Heisel. And down here you can see the tie to your AT&T property. Okay, I'll continue this at the end. I hope that's very important stuff to cover. The next person. I'm Jen Brooks, attorney from, from Meadow, and uh, yes, it's always bad news when you start getting more than one attorney involved in the situation. But I did want to address several concerns that I had and, and realized there may be a three minute limit. I did prepare three handouts. The one handout is just a cut up <laughs> an email I received from Northwestern Energy uh, with a thought that started a contact with Northwestern Energy. Uh, they provided me a contact name. The email indicates that he was not aware of anybody contacting ATT. Now, at the time, I wasn't aware of what time frame we were talking about. It now appears that it was back in 2013 or 14. So the reception that they may get from me from Northwestern Energy might be different now than it was uh, seven or six years ago. The other uh, handout that I have is uh, I've made a copy of the South Dakota uh, rules that apply and uh, the second page of that handout is actually a copy that I took off the County Highway uh, Superintendent's website. It shows the, uh, the roads in the county. The, uh, what's interesting to, about uh, this particular area is this township is an unorganized township. So therefore the uh, code section that I cite on the front page indicates that in an unorganized uh, uh, township that the county is the one that's responsible for maintenance of the roads. Now I think uh, the county has been fortunate up to this point that the residents along that road haven't insisted upon uh, the county maintaining it. Uh, that may be a different result if the county allows a 200-foot tower, 190-foot tower to be placed along that road. So I, I provide that uh, for your information. The last handout I have is just a, a kind of a colorful one. And I indicate reasons that uh, the board can use for rejecting this site. Uh, the, I think the, the biggest point I'd like to make here is that everybody has to follow the rules. It doesn't matter if you're an individual that's renting or if you own thousands of acres or whether you're AT&T, everybody has to follow the zoning ordinances. And AT&T has not done that here. They, uh, they have not looked at the property, their application indicated it was ag property. It's never been zoned a property. We look back to 2003 and it was still zoned residential back then. So thank you for your consideration of my handouts. John Seekmeyer, I live at uh, 221 Cedar Hill Road, quite close to this proposed site. Uh, my biggest concern is safety. Um, 310, I drive that road a lot. I've been 
number of homes down there by um, intersection of 310 and 400. Remember those kids walk through the tour of on the bus stop, which is at 310 and 400. They stand there beside the road. Being in construction, I know I got through their plans. They're going to dig a nine foot diameter by 27 foot deep hole filled with concrete. So there's your first satellite, multiple concrete trucks. Turn there, the radius to bring a 40 foot semi trailer around that corner. You're driving on people's driveways, up on yards. There's just no room. There's fences, trees, all sorts of things in the way. Uh, so then if you can bring in a tower, I'm sure it's going to come in in four or five or six sections. That's 40 foot trailers again. They all come in, they all go out, so there's a bunch of traffic. Our typical traffic out there is people in their SUVs, their cars, their pickups. We have deliveries of UPS and FedEx, but we don't have semi-trailer traffic on a regular basis. Um, so then I know how these things go. They're going to build this thing as fast as they can. There's going to be a flurry of activity, pickups and engineers and you name it. All these people are going to be rushing in and out of that site, which is not conducive to safety. People are out for a walk. They go down the road. There's no real space to walk. If there's snow piled up, it goes from a, it's not even 20 feet wide, down to a single track with snow piles on each side. So the kids walk right in the roadway. Um, if a fire or ambulance needed to come down that road, I'm sure there would be a delayed response if they got four semi trucks lined up with tower sections parked on the road, waiting to get into the property. There's going to be a delayed response time. Um, then what's going to happen? Once they trash the road in the rain or muddy conditions, they're going to drive on to Cedar Hill Road and use that as their secondary entrance. They say they won't, but I know construction guys are going to go the best way they can. They're going to find that's a better road. We pay for that to improve it, and that'll get trashed as well. We offer $10,000 to fix these things. I don't think that will go very far. So um, just to thing that I watched happen one day was the trash truck got stuck on the road. They call that a semi-wrecker to pull the trash truck out. Semi-wrecker gets stuck. So the next thing they bring a big old 500 horsepower 8x8 John Deere tractor out to pull the whole mess out. And at the end of the deal, I mean, the, the ruts and the road in the way for weeks or months because we just got little tractors to fix this stuff. So here again, we got a fire, All right. safety, <laughs> time. Thank you. Thank you. Next person. Good evening, Nancy Winnaley, and I'm representing Yankton Area Progressive Growth, the Yankton Area Chamber of Commerce, and the Yankton Convention and Visitors Bureau. I think the one thing that we're all agreeing on tonight is there is a lack of cell phone coverage out in that area. And I know that the county commission has worked diligently to try to alleviate some of the concerns for infrastructure issues. Your own mission statement for Yankton County starts with the mission of Yankton County is to provide citizens with high quality public services. And I think that's what we're all trying to do here today is to find a way to increase those public services. All of our three entities, along with the county and the city, District 3, and several other groups in town work to increase economic development opportunities. And we do that in partnership, and it's incredibly helpful if we have that infrastructure in place. I think there's an expectation these days that you will have cell coverage when you're within eight or 10 miles of a city the size of Yankton. We have a lot of campers that come in, and that's a testimonial in your packet today from Casey Haberman talking about when the campers come in, there's an expectation that they're going to be able to have cell coverage along with broadband services so, so they can continue to work as many of us do while we're on vacation at the same time. I think that enhancing the infrastructure in that area is crucial to the development of our county and I know that that's what the mission is, is to increase those property tax values of the entire county and, and I know it's really frustrating to be on that side of 
I don't want it at my back door. I've been in that same situation and it is frustrating and difficult, but sometimes it does end up being the greater good that needs to be looked at in some of these situations. But I'm excited about the opportunity for additional cell coverage, as well as what um, Medco made a comment about increasing the cyber out in that area for broadband. So thank you very much for considering it. Okay, next person. Thank you, Commissioner. So my name is Dan Johnson. I'm a physician and I'm here speaking on behalf of myself and my wife, Mary Milroy. Um, we live in a home that's about a little over a mile to the west of where the proposed site is. Uh, we have Horizon as our cell service. Um, and as a physician living in that area, I, I took a call about every three or four nights um, for 25 years. And so I've seen the transition go from being um, basically tied to the landline to having pagers that allowed a little bit more freedom taking call to about 10 years ago when nobody had pagers anymore, we used our cell phones. You know, I'm in the ideal place in my home. I always have a, a cell signal. If I'm, and this is Verizon, not AT&T, this is supposedly the good coverage out there in my part of the, the lake area. But if I'm on the western side of the house, if I'm in uh, my metal building working, if I'm down below the hill, uh, apparently in the shadow of where the current cell service is, it's um, just the frustration of drop calls, uh, people saying they were trying to reach me and they couldn't. And so I'm here mostly just to attest to the fact that it's a great need to have better cell phone service out in the area uh, around the lake. I, I, like I said, I live about eight, nine miles to the west of Yankton, about two miles north of the lake. And I know a lot of my neighbors are in the same predicament that it's just uh, a little bit dangerous that we don't have cell service. It's going to be challenging for the um, first responders that might be in areas down along the lake. You know, if you boat along the lake, there's certain areas where you go beyond Gavin's Point, there is no cell service down on the water. So it's, it's important that we get a new cell tower, and uh, it's, a, it's a great need, and it'll be a huge advantage to get better, better service out there. Thank you for your time. Okay, hey, next person. My name is Chad Lacey, and I also live in the Gavin's Point area, and following with his comments, uh, cell service is very tricky where we are. Uh, I have Verizon, my wife has AT&T, and she normally leaves her phone sit on the desk because it says no service. Um, during camping season, it gets horrible. You know, the towers cannot handle. Uh, there's just, there's not enough capacity out there. There's not good signal. Uh, it, it's dangerous. I, if, if I wasn't home, my wife had to make a call. Maybe. She might have signal. She might be able to make a call. She might be able to receive a call. During COVID, my daughter came home, trying to work, uh, trying to take classes online, and it's very, very difficult. My wife was supposed to be working from home during that same time, so trying to have two people on very, very spotty internet, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, there is definitely a need for a tower out there. Thank you. Thank you. Next person. Uh, my name is Jim Thorson. I uh, uh, live at uh, 
360 while I was on the road. As an educator, been in a lot of education meetings fall, uh, and trying to stick to the agenda is one of the biggest problems. And I, as I, I, I've been to both of the other meetings, and this meeting is to decide on the site of a cell tower, not to argue the worth of a cell tower. There is nobody, I don't think, in this area that would argue that we would need better cell uh, coverage, the broadband, the worth of that, uh, everything associated with it. But we are, we are straying from the purpose of this meeting, and that is to decide if AT&T did due diligence and searching out all possible sites for this tower. And I, and I would like to hear Mr. Huber finish out his um, presentation here. Uh, it, it goes back to that, the uh, uh, article. Uh, this is just not a, a uh, suitable site for this type of endeavor. And, and so all the people who come up here and want to tell about how we need cell service is not, I don't think, a part of this, this meeting or the purpose of this meeting. We're here to decide on whether this is a suitable site. Okay, okay next person. Okay, if no one else wants to speak right now, then I'm going to let people finish that spoke before and then finish what they wanted to say. Three minutes, yeah. Okay. three minutes? Yeah, three minutes, so. Okay, um, well, I covered the dead bed. That was too low of an offer. Carnazzo never got an offer. He had agricultural land, but he never got an offer. DUI water tank. Um, this is at the intersection of Highway 50 and 52. at ts conclusion was that the tower was too short, but they never evaluated the other 100 acres that are adjacent to the tower. I'll further evaluate that site later. Um, then I started evaluating other properties in the area that they hadn't contacted. One was Gavin's Point National Fish Hatchery. I contacted the, the project manager, Nick Starzel. He says that the uh, he's the uh, project manager. Fish Hatchery leases about 200 acres from the Corps of Engineers. According to AT&T, their cell tower is acquired by federal government, and the Fish Hatchery and the Corps of Engineers is part of the federal government, so this should be a good combination. Nick says that part of the property is currently leased to the area farmers, so there's a possibility they would lease land to a sub for a cell tower. AT&T has never contacted the Fish Hatchery. I also contacted Jay Bachelor, who has over 400 acres of property pasture land about a mile east of the proposed site. He is currently, he is open to discussion of the possibility of locating South Tower's property, but Jay, but Jay Bachelor has never been contacted by the AT&T. Here's the fish hatchery down there on the screen. This is Jay Bachelor's land over on the, the mile east of the property. Next person I contacted was Donald McDonald. He has over 400 acres of property pasture land about a half mile, so it's very close to the northeast of the proposed site. He is open to discuss the possibility of locating a tower in his property. Donald McDonald was never contacted by AT&T. Another person I contacted was Robert Ostamore, who owns property located on the southwest corner of Highway 50 and Highway 52. Previously, there was a police radio tower on this property. The tower became obsolete and was removed into 2019. He is open to discussing putting another tower in that same location, but he has never been contacted by AT&T. Shouldn't we that? He is over there you can see just down to the, to the west of Highway 52, just to the south of Highway 50. Um, I also contacted Bob Law. He has numerous properties in the search area. Um, <clears throat> Let me show you that. Uh, 
Uh, he has numerous properties in this search area, but one of the properties is particularly interesting is at the intersection of Highway 50 and 435th Avenue. According to Bob, this, is a, this site is a high point in the area. There was a communication tower previously located there. He is open to discuss the possibility of locating a cell tower in this property, but Bob Wall was never contacted by AT&T. Hi. I got one more property. Remember? Scrambler's Cycle Club. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I contacted Waylon Payer, who manages the Scrambler's Cycle Club. The club owns more than 100 acres located on the intersection of Highway 50 and 52. You can see it right there in the white. The UI water tank is also located in that site. If you look close, you can see it in the upper, hand, upper left hand corner of that white piece of property there. So, it is, so being that the, the water tower is there, we know it's a high point in the area. And it's actually about 100 feet higher in elevation than what the site is that at t is looking at. This property also has about 1,200 feet of frontage on Highway 50 and 2,600 feet of frontage on Highway 52. Will himself commented to me that this property would be an excellent location for a cell tower. He is open to discuss the possibility of locating a cell tower in his property and is actually very anxious, but he has never been contacted by AT&T. Other properties. I personally own 300 acres that border just to the left, just to the west of this. You can see where I'm at on the map right there. I'm touching Krieger's property. They never contacted me. They never asked me anything of, of whether I was interested in locating it. Just the fact that they're not contacting any of these landowners. The Chesky family owns 640 acres right beside me. They were never contacted by at and And so, evidently, the only local property owners that AT&T contacted were the three properties that they had at the beginning of the list. In fact, even though AT&T has been working on this tower for several years, I know or any other local resident was notified of proposed AT&T tower until exactly 10 days prior to the county zoning meeting. So we had no opportunity to even research this or anything else. My conclusion is that I could have searched longer and found more suitable properties, but I think I've proven my point. Over a thousand acres of suitable properties have been located within the AT&T cell tower search area. All of these property owners are willing to discuss the location of cell towers and property. Some of them are quite anxious to get more information, but none of them were contacted by AT&T. I can furnish contacts and phone numbers for all of these properties. I believe that AT&T may, AT may need to consider offering more than the overall offer, which is what they offered Medved to, in order to lease these properties. And I believe Commissioner Healy, last meeting, he summed it up when he said that uh, the county commission will help find a suitable cell tower site, but they are not responsible for finding the least expensive site. If I were at and I'd be very upset if whoever was responsible for locating a site for the cell tower because there are hundreds or thousands of acres of suitable property in ATT search area, but the owners have never been contacted by ATT. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to finish what they wanted to say? Um, my name's Sarah, my mom, and I'm just curious if um, AT&T can pull up their map for their coverage, what this new proposed cell site, site is going to do. Because the people that were Gavin's Point area, I'm pretty sure they're in the purple area on that map, and so it's not going to help them anyway. So it's kind of a new point for them really wanting this tower in this location. It seems like they need a tower over by their area. And through my research, um, Dan Johnson has like 13 acres, and so if he's so um, in favor of this tower, maybe he should consider placing one on his property. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else want to speak? Do you want to finish what you were going to say? My last point that I had mentioned, um, uh, talking about a cell tower as being the right thing, but in the wrong location. My third reason was the ingress and egress for the area is not compatible with the commercial property. And I have explained um, uh, about that. Um, it was identified that uh, to do this road right, the estimated cost um, for uh, 
development of this road would be $400,000. And that was per Yankton County Highway Superintendent Mike Sedlachuk. Um, this was um, brought up by Dan Klimish at the last meeting. Um, I'm suggesting that if this conditional use permit is allowed, the county needs to build the road to their specifications and then build AT&T. This would also require ongoing maintenance, um, further adding to the county's cost. Um, as brought up by Commissioner Dan Clemish at the second meeting for this request, if the county allows a public use for this road, the road should also be maintained by the county, which is going to increase your cost. Um, according to the county zoning ordinance, section 1805, the planning commission shall make a recommendation with options of granting, granting with conditions, or denying the application. Um, one um, condition that I would consider or have you consider if you are going to approve this is they need to do some decent landscaping around this wood tower so that it looks a little bit better in the area. But my feeling is that um, the appropriate response would be to deny the application. The county has the right and even the obligation to make the right decision for the people in the Yankton area based on all this information provided. This cell tower is the right thing in the wrong location. Thank you. My name is Ken Gunter and just want to remind the commission, this decision was tabled on condition that a and would look for other locations. Mr. Hubert just proved tonight that they did not fulfill their need. I don't think they have the right to build a tower in this location. They did not follow through what they said they would do. Mr. Birch, are you still here? I am. All right. I don't want to take up much of the additional time. Uh, I think you've already heard uh, what I would call substantial evidence for denying this application. But the main point I want to make is I feel that the, uh, the board needs to deny the application because they haven't followed the strict requirements of the ordinance. Uh, last time I had talked about the balloon test and there's very strict uh, things that they have to do, one being flying a three foot balloon uh, for four continuous hours. Uh, for some reason, they felt that they could substitute that with uh, a drone uh, flying for an hour and then uh, later on another half hour. They've not met that requirement. The question was asked, well, what did the notice in the paper say? The, uh, I, had, I called the, the press of Dakota to ask them what the legal notice uh, provided. They were able to find me a, a notice that had been published uh, previous um, on May 7th. I think that was the, the notice they were talking about was effective, so they needed to publish it a different time. The ordinance requires that it be published in two successive weeks prior to the balloon being flown. Uh, the press in Dakota couldn't find uh, that legal notice. And I don't know if, if, if there's, what the reason was that they couldn't find it but they could not produce it for me. And I think that's something that should have been included in at and package uh, when it was presented to the board. And it was not just like the uh, uh, denial from Northwestern Energy was not included in the packet, which the ordinance specifically says it must be included. So I think they failed to comply with all the requirements of the ordinance. And even if you have an advisor that uh, chooses to overlook the requirements of the ordinance, he can't modify the ordinance. This board can't modify the ordinance. Only the county commissioners can modify an ordinance after the procedure that's required to modify ordinances. So I think this board is actually required to reject the application because they failed to follow the requirements of the ordinance. Thank you, that's all I wanted to stress. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak? Uh, 
plus my chance. Okay, last call. Okay, hearing none, the time for additional public comment is over and we can have um, three minutes to rebut. What? Any longer than that? Okay. All right. I, I, thank you, Madam Chair. Ten minutes. All right. I, I, I certainly wouldn't intend to use ten minutes. A lot of what was offered um, for testimony, I think, misapplies the federal standards that this board has before it um, that were all laid in the submissions. Um, once we've shown that there's a gap in coverage and an app, and there's an absence of a less intrusive alternative. Um, the burden shifts to this board to show not only that there are these other hypothetical places out here, that's not the standard, okay? I understand that you've called a lot of landowners and you have other people that are willing to offer property, but that is not the standard. The standard is, it is presented by this board that it is technologically feasible and it is less intrusive than the proposed facility. The fact that you have a few individual landowners or even a dozen individual landowners doesn't change the fact that at and has done the analysis as it's required to do federally. And it is submitted to this board in its packet of information, the information that it needs to present. Now I'm gonna have Jim Tidmore from at and talk about that, the site selection process itself and some of the things that have been stated here that aren't necessarily accurate. And at that point, I'll address the road issues. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Tidmore. I'm the RF design engineer for southeastern uh, South Dakota, Nebraska, and the west or the western side of Iowa. I'm the one who I've worked for AT&T since 2009. I worked on this project in 2012, 13, 14, and on. Most of these locations I have evaluated personally. I have looked at these locations. One thing that I wanted to correct is what AT&T's requirement is for as uh, looking for that we have to look for existing uh, towers, and that's our number one um, priority. That's not our number one priority. Our number one priority is customers. The areas that we're having issues with in Yankton, in Yankton County, is the Lewis and Clark area. It's the recreational area. It's the front down by Highway 52. It's going into town. That's the area that I concentrate on to where I have issues with people connecting, people calling, and people having capacity. As noted before by somebody else, even sometimes in the summer when you can call, you get block call. Once we determine an area that we find that I can get a reasonable, pro reasonable propagation, then we follow all the procedures that was, that was laid out. We look for any existing towers, because we'd love to be on an existing tower. We looked at Northwestern Energy, and I, I, I personally wanted to get the site, but was rejected by Northwest Energy because they wanted that uh, it wouldn't structurally handle what we wanted to do as far as placing antennas. I've looked at net, net bed, and I've looked at both locations. The tower location, uh, the tower heights that I would need would be around 400 foot, which would once again would become an issue for Yankton County. But then we run into other issues. We've worked really hard to try to find an area that we could keep it to 190 feet where we eliminate lighting. So that's one of the issues I know that you don't want anywhere if you're trying to minimize at nighttime when you would have lighting to uh, obstruct the nighttime view. You go further uh, east towards the McDonald's and uh, Bachelors, I, I'm probably saying that wrong. Then you run into uh, existing coverage that we have coming out of Yankton. Our area of concern is to get the best service we can and start covering the Lewis and Clark area. That's why the uh, Craters location and further south is what we're looking for and maintaining the existing time. And that's all I have. Have you ever looked at? Having a booster tower, I mean, I know we're a site location for a cell phone or for a high speed internet. So we can beam the one if you had a shorter tower at a different location, you can beam down to the lake, or you just try to get into all those valleys that are around the lake to the foot of one tall. 
Yeah, the word, 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 what we're going to be talking about is sort of like a repeater. Mm -hmm. And it's just as easy to do a full cell site as it is to do a repeater. Because we can do smaller locations. You can be closer to Lewis and Clark. I would love to do that. But I've never, we, we have not been able to get close to Lewis and Clark. We've got the same issues we're running into now. And that trying to find a location that makes, makes people happy that we can get good coverage. And since first status came out, I know it seems like a, a redundant issue of trying to cover FirstNet and trying to uh, cover our first responders. We're trying to cover everywhere we can. And this is one of the areas that we we're, we're, uh, we have a gap. We have a hole in there for you. Uh, your county sheriff's coming through. Your ambulance is coming through. But they may or may not be able to continue coverage. And that, that's something that we're trying very, very hard nationwide to, to stop. And, and I, I think it's a privilege that Gaithy uh, County is one of those counties that is high on our radar to try to, to complete, to try to get better service for you. And but the problem is we're just finding it difficult to get any locations approved. You're renting this land, releasing, uh, releasing this site, is that correct? You're buying the land? That has to be done by the uh, uh, that property people by the week, so I'll go through with you. Forgive me because it's in somewhere in this packet and we've talked before, but do you feel this site satisfies your your coverage requirement or there was a letter that might have been from you, maybe, I'm trying to find it, but it identified five small cell sites that would be required along 50 feet to complete the coverage. Yeah, yeah we're, we, we always look for multiple solutions. And the other solution is doing CRAN sites at the same time. Because well, CRAN sites. Sorry, just to interrupt, just to more specific to this, um, there was a letter regarding going from 400 foot tower to 190 or 200 foot tower in this location. And the, the result of conclusion that I remember from the letter, I'll keep looking for it, was that. 200, a 200 foot tower in combination with, with these small cell sites would satisfy the. Would give us our best result. Absolutely. If when we identify five locations along the, the Highway 52 that would allow for much uh, for much improved coverage over the, even this tower, allow you to drive through it. And those, those sites uh, are still in the process of trying to be worked, and that's a that's a future development. Uh, I, I can't work on what I might get. I'm working on what I've got funded and what I can what I can do. Uh, those, those, those smaller cells aren't funded yet, so I, I I can't go by that. I can go by what I have. Because what happens if I do if I do say that I have to have both and then one falls through for funding, then I'm, I'm I have the other. And for a creator, that's my that's my minimal solution for getting coverage that will improve. It. I would have to the rest of our recreational attitude. And I guess that's more what I'm asking more specifically is what this letter identified was that you did need both. You needed the trigger 200 foot tower with. Uh, it would always help. So I'll, I'll try to find that to be more clear. But yeah, we, don't, we don't particularly need to have these uh, the, the, uh, small cells. There are the CRAN sites to improve the coverage, but it would, it would definitely help. Sure. Will the Scramblers cycle sites work? I don't know what a scram. No, I already checked the water tank, and I checked the Scrambler sites, and both of them were too low. I'm sorry. Unless we start getting up to three to 400 foot again, we run into the same issue. What are the, the towers is actually 100 feet higher than the proposed site information? And the other thing that I'm concerned about is from the previous meetings, now the criteria has changed as far as what the search area is. Previously, in the two previous meetings, at and &E said the search area was 431 Avenue, 436 on the, on the east side, 308 on the north the lake on the south. Now you're pinpointing it to just the Krieger property is the only acceptable site, even though that criteria was much expanded the last two meetings. I don't understand how that can change. All right, does anybody have any other questions? <coughs> I'd like to address the real issue. That's not, please. That'll be the end of my rebuttal. Um, 
I think there's just some basic misunderstandings on the road issue. I understand that there is a private drive involved. My landlord, I don't say mine, but the, the landlord of the cell tower site has the right to use that private road. If that landlord is responsible to a tenant causing damage to that road, AT&T damages the road during the construction of that facility, AT&T will be responsible for the repair of that road caused by its damage to the property. And then, can you explain why he had the right to use that private drive? Does he have an agreement in place? Or is there he, with his acquisition of the property, there was a road use agreement that was uh, except that their access was not through no. 310. I do three different things. I'm gonna answer your question. I'm gonna to try to answer your question. Okay. okay. Um it's my understanding and looking at the deed record that tenant has there's a road use agreement for certain egress and egress rights to the property. So you don't have those things. You, sorry, you don't have those the deed records in my file. That show that ingress egress agreement to that. I can provide it to you guys. That is what we asked for the deed. It's attached to that. Right. There is also a public highway. So if my thought Alternatively, the, the, the opposite side of that would be that my client, the, my, I'm sorry, the landlord has no right to get to my property. There's no right. Here. So, and I, I get the section line argument that you know there's a right of way there. There's I, also Cedar Hill Road, correct? Is that am I using that term right? And that is private. That's private. So my that's what I'm right to traverse that road. And that's what I'm asking. How did? If they, if how does he have that right? Or that? He might very well have the right. I'm asking. So I take a judge to settle that. Okay. If people don't believe that he does for the open and notorious use of that road by the people that acquired that property 20 plus years ago, I put in my head. But back to the question about damage, because it's a private road, not a county road. AT&T, if its trucks were to be damaged, that road would be legally obligated to pay for the damage by the customer. So if this if this proposed site were to be approved, the uh, path for uh, construction and whatnot would be through uh, which route three ten or the crash drive. So I'm honestly not the engineer, okay. so I can't answer that question. Okay. The client requires the right to build unless we have the assessor right. At a minimum, though, we have a right to traverse the public highway through the DOT application process. At a minimum. Sorry, say that again. At a minimum, we have a right to traverse the public highway after we apply to the DOT for a right to put on the county uh, telecommunications facility in the right. That's the end of my rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to have another couple questions. I think. Oh, sure. You want to say anything? One of them just, I know uh, Northwestern was discussed in the tower, and, and um, you mentioned the letter from Northwestern. Yeah. I don't know that I got that. It's in the big packet. It's in the big packet? Yeah. I just got it. Don't ask me, I looked at the other day. 332. Um, I just received that this morning. I've been in contact with Northwestern oh, yeah. since September. It was dated somewhere. yesterday. And it said that the location that that tower has four co locates on it now and cannot take additional facilities. Okay. And it should have been emailed um, to. I think uh, I got it. That's the one that was. And that's the yeah. one I, I just wanted to be clear. Yeah, there's, there's a packet too. That's yeah. like a, but it's a packet. I can't remember where exactly. I, I read it. It's a single page dated October 12th from Northwestern. I apologize. We've been in contact with them, but it's been you know, we're a lot of old ground with them. Well, the reason I the reason I asked that, and I and I, you know, my conversation with uh, Ms. Johnson last week on the phone, it's it's hard to sit here and make a decision on some of these things because the original packet and information provided 
said there really was no conversation with no question. And then when I talked with her, it was that um, there was a previous conversation on a different project um, and identified that that power essentially was full. And then we talked during this power um, review or site review, it was excluded. And then I think I heard another version of that yet tonight. And so now I'm trying to make sense of, of when these conversations happened and how I mean, are we right. supposed to, to make a decision, I guess. It, All you have before you is what was provided today, which is a letter from Northwest Energy. I can tell you from my involvement in the past month, I've been discussing this matter with an associate that works for Northwestern Energy. Um, there's a long history between uh, at and and Northwestern trying to place facilities on um, this location. Um, and uh, the, the emails that were replayed and retraced going back to 2013-14 were extensive. Uh, but um, I, this might be more for people. I want to Oh no, but the letter just states yeah. that there aren't suffi there's insufficient room on that tower to place a facility. And the negotiations in 13-14 had to do with other matters, at least in putting an additional tower in there, or as Kerry Johnson said, tearing that tower down, building a new tower for the existing property um, there. So it wasn't a viable site. The current tower is not a viable site for the location. That's what the letter says. I, part of what I wanted to clarify is I, and maybe I heard wrong, but I thought that the, the recommendation or not recommendation, but the solution was that yes, if the tower was full and it would require a drop and swap, as they say, and um, and at the 2013-2014 time frame, uh, AT&T was not interested in that, and that's fine. Um, I thought I heard tonight somebody say that Northwestern has said that they don't even want, won't even entertain that with at and That's where I was curious if it was in this letter or where that came <laughs> from. I, what I can tell you is that in the 2013 time frame, going back to 12 hours, we had negotiations back and forth between the parties. Uh, those negotiations did not uh, come to fruition. That was due to result of some, the county at the time was aware of that. And uh, the county was aware that we could be done with their second meeting at that time. For discussion now. We enjoy discussion. Yes, absolutely. Okay, my my opinion is they did not look for any other sites in the last month. Um, Ingress, egress is still poor at best. And if they come in to put broadband in and that road is not where it's supposed to be, 
How are they going to deal with that? Because the right of way is not where the right of way should be on that road. I think that it's possible for them to find a site where they aren't affecting the immediate landowners to the degree that they are. That's my In the findings of that, number five, section A, ingress and egress to proposed structures therein, it's poor. Traffic flow and control, safety hazard, access in case of a fire catastrophe, the road is <coughs> a dirt trail. Um, we've already seen an immediate and concrete economic impacts on the landowners because of this, this proposed tower. So to say that it doesn't affect property values, I think is ludicrous. <coughs> Compatibility with the neighborhood, I think we've heard lots of testimony on that. So that's my opinion. I welcome other opinions if you want to bring them forward. I've jotted down just a few things I would like to clarify according to the ordinance, and I, I'll try to get through them. Um, I'll make a broad statement to start though. But one, I do, I think everyone's in agreement that there's poor coverage and we need to work on getting expanded coverage and broadband. And it's extremely important today. Um, it's something that as a commission we've we've taken the stance that we you know support and look for expansion. And um, I will say I I agree just in general that the probably better locations. Um, and I know there's certain search criteria to and they're after certain areas, and I understand that. The numerous just issues and roads and things that have to be considered. Um, that's in general. What what we need to do is is look at our ordinance and does do they meet the ordinance or not? Is what it boils down to. And um, I looked at twenty five hundred three. Uh, I'm not going to go into I just kind of want to point other to the things that I've been looking at as I had I wasn't 100% sure or clear that they were identified yet. Some I think have throughout the evening, but um, some of the things that stuck out for me are 2503, uh, 4, 5, and 6 regarding co location, stealth technology, and then 6 is the most appropriate site. 2506-11A, um, I think, actually, so, uh, one thing I'm still unclear on is 2507, um, and that regards priority, prioritization of, of their search criteria, and I would like to maybe bring that back in on some of those discussions that we certainly can discuss. Um, 2508 uh, shared use, 2501. Um, what the ordinance states is the county, as opposed to the construction of a new tower, shall prefer locating on existing towers. And then, you know, I think four structures without increasing the height. So we're, we're down to the northwestern and the water tower. Um, the applicant shall submit a comprehensive report inventorying existing towers and other suitable structures within two miles of the location of any proposed new tower unless the applicant can show that some other distance is more reasonable and demonstrate conclusively why an existing tower or other suitable structure cannot be used. And it's maybe in a roundabout way it's been done. 
yeah, just uh, express my frustration on the multiple answers that were given. Um, Yeah, 2509. Anyway, those are some of the things that I felt were the merits of discussion here. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Tidmore one question. Or could I ask you a question? Yeah. Was in regard to actually in regard to your letter, but uh, response dated October eighth, and some of the different sites. And I guess, I think I know how we got here, but uh, the search site was limited to, or the, the analysis was limited to 200 foot hours. Correct. Where did that come from? That required? Yeah, that was a stipulation I was given for a lot of sites that we could get them with. Now I have light. Once you go about 200 foot, then at that point you have to have light. Right, it would be more more complicated. So uh, the choice was to keep it at 190. And 190 yeah. then and that then it's limits you and reduces your search rating by quite a lot. See, and I think that's where some of the maybe confusion and I think there was maybe a um, miscommunication. I I was not aware that we anyone was limited to the 200. I, my my take on it was that if we had this site at 200 feet, but there's a better site with very few old ground egg lambs at 400 foot, is that going to get the coverage there? Right. That was, I guess, what I was expecting. To look for. My recollection is that the county consultant recommended I say below 200 foot. Uh, if we go above 200 foot, we start looking at 300 foot. That's why the Northwest Tower was, was not ruled out in my, my book at the time because it was 300 foot. That's right. And then 300 foot, <laughs> and then it opened up a lot. And then that property was at 400 foot. That's why that opened up more options for that to be a lot of And then you can sort of see see the issues that I have just curling the way higher. And that was my understanding going through all this. Is I think Mr. Geardy, you know, this we've gone through, uh, changed hands several times since, since this began. And um, what I gathered, and I, I spoke with uh, Pat Geardy on this when we first took office, and he had just mentioned that ATP was coming, going to be coming forward. And I think at that time, it would be, I think he had said that. You come forward for a 400 foot tower at one time, and he said it likely would not be received well. Right. And it was switched to 200, but I think that was for that location, if I remember right. I guess what I'm getting at, and I know you only do, you know, you, you're given information and you make exactly. propagation maps. Yep. But that is one of my concerns is that are we limiting our search because we have this fictitious height placed on us? I mean, I, I've never heard this like that. That's, I mean, uh, and that's why I just want to make sure I'm not the only one. I'm talking about over 200 foot, but I didn't know if there was a problem uh, in previous conversation. I think, I think that requirement maybe wasn't, I think it maybe came from years ago, you know, from maybe the start of this at that location. And that's, I just wanted to, See if there's any indication that we 
to the application, they can have it here if you want to see it.
So it, it came in as 400 foot, and then I believe it was our consultant that <laughs> uh, working with, with the current zoning administrator just felt that that was not going to work in that location, right. um, and that maybe a 200 foot tower was. And, and that's where this project proceeded. And that's where my question is in the most recent search for property, even in, in the letter uh, dated October 8th, you know, there's different sites identified. Um, and it kind of mentions that due to the 200 foot requirement, is limited in sites. And that's why I wanted to be clear, I guess, or at least get it clear. So everyone's on the same page. And my understanding was the 200 foot was limited to that site, whereas if it was out in the middle of an agricultural zone area, 400 foot maybe. And my understanding was that any location around the area we have to do 200 foot. Okay. So that's, that's the evaluation why I went off uh, where we were looking at the other location. Right. Yeah. So that I kept the same exact model for every site. So you can understand how it works. That's why you see a difference in the property. Right. 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 Those propagation maps, those were 700. Uh, that's, that's correct. Okay. Everything was, was done on the first one. Okay. There's <laughs> one I wanted to maximize as much as we could. So the idea wasn't to try to pull it in, it was to try to take it out. So. I didn't want to show you an under coverage by like doing a higher frequency, which would have made it look, look a lot smaller. I was going to ask you, how much are you going to lose when you go to like 30? You run 30 quarters. Uh, what's your, what's like your. Currently, currently, right now, for this this county, we run what's called eight, uh, 859 hertz. We run ECS, which is 1900 megahertz, and AWS. Which is 2100 megahertz and WCS, which is 2300 megahertz. Okay. I assume all that will go on this. That's correct. Most of this. How much do you lose on that? I'm just curious. You, you will lose For a certain amount the higher you get. But the fortunate thing that we can do is we do have a fair amount of 700 in Yankee County and 850. 850 is also a really good frequency for property. Um, that's all I have needed. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. I have a question in that if they analyzed all these properties, Mr. Kiddo. Okay. If they analyzed all these properties, how come they aren't listed? I mean, he bothered to list these 17 other sites like our tracks, Gary Dock, all those he listed well, as bragging that he, he analyzed. Said that he was they limited the search to a 200 foot tower. So a 400 foot tower might have worked well farther out, but he didn't use that in the site analysis. Why did he use that in the end of the front house? He said they were in the 400 tower, then he should have been analyzed, then he should have had the other. I think in the most recent analysis, it was limited to 200, and in the past, it was also the time. Yeah, understand. Even that, why he would have been That's what I think. Yeah, I think that's, right. what I, that's what I. That's what I think. Yeah. 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 What's interesting is, as Christy really put things out. Certain things that they've all mentioned that I've started searching for. And the one thing, yes, they did announce it, they did put it in the paper. But if I remember correctly, they did not complete the test correctly. The balloon test. Because it says they are supposed to do it. Uh, for these four consecutive hours between 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. If I remember correctly, they didn't do that. But I think that that was what that 
If we uh, do deny the jurors based upon their evidence, as part of the process, I just want to make sure that. And on our consulting, when he consults, he goes over Article 25. And I, I don't have any disagreement with Article 25. I just doesn't make this in the secrets. I'm section 25. Thank you for that clarifying I think part of the thing about cool that the mandate and even if you look at the solving the analysis and the quote from the conversation tonight. It's not, we're not denying the, the concept. I mean, the, 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 the school is court. It's right. just got to be in a better state. Mm -hmm. I agree with what Paul said about the exclusive because if you read through the examples that they went through, and this wasn't feasible, the, this one here was feasible, and it was available, but it was more intrusive. And a couple of areas were down by the light. I'm thinking for those are people that want the herbs, you know, that have the campers and stuff. So who cares what they look out at because they're looking out at towers that are already down so like Tom and all the other distractions that they have and all the campers and all the stuff that's down there anyway. Yeah, down in the commercial. Yeah, like right. the scramble and stuff like that. I mean, that's already a commercial. It's already there. Yeah. Or, or even if they could go down by the fish hatchery. Tower, that's not in someone's face that lives in
All right. Uh, Ruth Jensen, Petition for Review Committee Appointment and all the meeting law. You're up next. Thank you. You're I thank you for having me tonight. And uh, when I was on the commission, I felt sorry for the planning commission because you do a lot of work and you get no credit. I don't know what pay you get now, but for the bigger increases, that's all I can say. 25 bucks, guys. 25 bucks? Wow. <laughs> no, I'm going to, I'm just going to go over this case right now, but. Uh, On uh, October 6, 2020, we had three commissioners have a, a meeting that did not talk to the other two, Dan Clinish and uh, Gary Swenson. And uh, open meeting law, I mean, come on, guys. Uh, uh, I don't, I'm very disappointed in you that you guys even did it. You were at that meeting? No, nobody was. It wasn't even put in the paper. We have it. Huh? So how are we so sure that we have it? Because you got it on tape. It's tape of all things. I'd like to see that meeting. Well, it's pretty pathetic that three of you do that behind closed doors. Don't tell the public. Don't even advertise it. And that's why I'm here tonight because I've got um, I've got a complaint to appear already. We're going to push this hard because you guys know good. better. I mean, my my little uh, nephew would know better than what you guys do. Your uh, county commissioners, come on! If you don't know the law, what what's an open meeting to you? What does that mean? What is transparency? All right. Here's here's what I want to do. In the fact that I gave you, I have three changes coming up, so like the setbacks, uh, acreage, two acres. What I want to do to do tonight is I, I don't care if you're for it or against it, but I want you to vote for it because I am taking the third election. Plus, I'm taking the event that, that has nothing to do with you, uh, the wheel tax. That's got to be a separate issue, but I want to start getting names. So we're going to have an election. People are really ticked. People are getting so taxed. Between the city and the county, there's there's not rich people in this county. We're all hurting. Every one of us. So what I want is for you and people, somebody make a motion. They use, you know what three things I've got, I gave you in the packet. I hope you got them. And got them. And that's what I want. Somebody to make a motion. I don't care if you accept it or not. And then on the 20th of October, I want you to go to the county commission to the board of adjustments and I want them to get a vote too. I don't care if they vote. If they vote no, that's probably the way they will go. But I, then I can take it to election because I have to get the signatures to set a time for the election. So will somebody here make a motion and second so on the table so you guys have to vote? I don't care if you accept it or not, but I gotta have in minutes that you voted on this so I can take the election. <laughs> like I mean you guys you guys have been working on this for two years. Nothing about it. Yeah, may I address the Well, if you don't want to do it, that's pretty small of you. So I don't care one way or the other. Bruce. Let the people vote on this. Bruce. Taxpayers. What? I asked you the first time you brought this forward, and I see you haven't done any homework on it. There's several things I asked you. Look, look at what you hey. What you that? guys did on this, you changed the whole thing. One of them, Bruce, the 
probably the most important is in this that you're asking us to review, you've added two paragraphs that don't exist in the current ordinance, and then you don't even put them in the verbiage of them in here. A 7B, uh, 8B. You mean the four animal units? Is that what you're talking about? The 8F, I think, is the one that doesn't make one of these, <laughs> I think it's 8F, does not exist in our current ordinance. And I asked you, what does that paragraph say? You couldn't even tell me. So did you write this? Yes. What, is it, what does eight F say? And we can't <laughs> take any action with the missing paragraph. What's missing on it that you had before? The only thing that's we added to class F for this off and the two acre rule is the other one and the half mile setbacks for tables. Nothing has changed from the last time I was here. It was weak. I know and it wasn't complete last time that's why I asked for it. It's exactly the same thing I had last time. All you want to do is fight because you don't want to do people to vote on it. But we're gonna one way or there I'm gonna do it. All up just just vote one way or the other. Well, no, I don't really care. Let the people decide. They're going to decide. You guys are supposed to decide. You ran on the election that you were going to change that you never did. Bruce, right here, you reference class F 50 to 99. Yeah. Section 519, paragraphs 2, 3, 4, 5, 7F, 8F, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 7F and 8F do not exist in the ordinance as it reads today. So I think if you're asking us to take action on a proposed change, you should at least tell us what 7F and 8F says in your proposed change. I told you this at the very first time you presented this. It's incomplete. We can't take any action on it. Yeah, because you don't want to. <laughs> Oh, everything is funny to you, isn't it? All you do is sit there and condemn and bring things up that you don't understand. All you want to do is prove everybody's wrong, but you're right. Uh, I want I want you to vote on it, and if it's wrong, then the election will be wrong in the morning. Somebody will somebody please do a. a a motion and a second, please. Yeah. So, but I got a question. What I, you know, I've read over all this stuff. Like I said earlier tonight, I read everything that. Yeah, you do. I have not seen seven F and eight F. What is it? What does it say? That would be something that you would have to add. You'd have to add those two paragraphs, just like when we when we rewrote the. Uh, uh, Accessory structures, you know, when we updated that part of the ordinance, I had to rewrite part of that ordinance so that it was changed to those previous sections. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Okay. So, so what he's saying is we just need to for you to write up a paragraph, you know, just like in 7E and in 8E, that's for class E. So your section seven would be for a new class you're creating. That would be, it, it'd be class the setback, F. Setback for class F. It would be the yeah. setback for class F. So you just need to write up just a little paragraph that said in class F, the setbacks will be X, Y, Z. Seven, uh, seven and eight. Right. Those and, two and I would make one more suggestion to you. And that is in the third line down there. It says, additionally, the applicant shall locate the operation. You should have a little phrase in there that says, no closer than. No closer than. Okay. No closer than, you know, a half mile, 2,640 feet. Just, just minor changes. Because if you want us to bring this to the board, it should be everything should be in order so that it's legal. 
I had an attorney look at this. So this is not I didn't do my own. It was at the end of the day on a Friday. Well, I don't know. But those would be my suggestions. So now I have to wait a whole four weeks when they meet again. So I am sorry, and I had no idea it was going to be this late by the time we got to. I am sincerely sorry. Just you get a room full of angry people. It goes on for a long time. Well, I know where I've been there. Um, I have to wait for more. What do you have your next meeting? Second Tuesday of every month. Every month. Yes. So put yourself on the agenda. I'll get that word done for you. And then you won't have a morning. Uh, you're not going to be taking two weeks off. Okay. Bruce will be going to have Okay. And we'll be done. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you for being patient. Being yeah. Thank you for all you guys who do. Thank you. Have a safe drive home then. <laughs> okay, now we have a full flow of plaques. Do we have anybody that wants to also want to stop? Oh. We gotta get through the plaques before we get to public comments. So one thing at a time. Okay. <clears throat> okay, flat of lot 17 of Sundance Ridge, located in the west half of section 12, T93 North, range 57 west of the 50 m Yankton County, South Dakota. Move approval of the flat. Second. Okay. Can we go all those in favor? We need a roll call on these. Right. I don't think we need a roll call on these. Well, all right. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion is approved. Okay. Preliminary plat of lots one through ten of lot four, lots one and two of lot five, and lots one through twelve of lot six. In the law overlook subdivision in the southeast quarter of section seven, in the northeast quarter of section eighteen, all in tract 93 north, range 56 west of the 5th PM in Yankton County, South Dakota. I have a question for Gary. Gary, this preliminary plan, um, we're going to plant this, but when they get sold, they're going to have to come in again. Um, correct. So, did they realize that? Yes. Um, I know when the yeah, so yeah, you'll see the next day when actually is one of the lots in the subdivision. Oh, okay. Fine. That's going to be five of so you see, yeah. yeah. You were a long time to speak on this one. What, what do you want me to say? <laughs> Not the time. You're right. Why should we vote for it? Yeah. Do you want to sell power in this one? Not down. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want us? Did you want to say something on this? Or? Well, nothing. It just I got a lot sold, and then we got to get it approved so I can start building a house. Okay, that sounds pretty straightforward. Dennis, did you make a motion? I make a motion. I'll second Dennis's motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Back, 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 back
five law overlooked subdivision in the southeast yeah. corner of section yeah. seven yeah. and in the yeah. northeast yeah. corner yeah. of section 18. All in T93 North Range 56 West and 50 M Yankton County, South Dakota. Oh, we have a motion. Do we have okay. a second for that part? Yes. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion approved. <laughs> Plot of lot 17 in Gavin's Gulch, located in the Engen Track 14, section 15, T93 North, range 57 west of the 50 Young, Yankton, South Yankton County, South Dakota. My, my only question on this one is it says number of eight big zeros from the zero in the front. No, our, we have a new system now. It's a part of what it currently recognizes it as under. Um, but down below, we're working out some of the, the steps. But if you look under what is this lot size? Yeah, right now. Right yeah. yeah. So the right hand side, we were seeing that. Okay. I just saw yeah. on all the other ones, we did the number of acres. Yeah, that's good. Correct. The system is brand new. Should, so, should we, like, do a Cross and put the actual size on that because it that should be 2.4 inches. 0.0. .0. That should actually be 2.4 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
on the uh, article five. Yes. I'm going to just start real quick, just give an overview. So, all I'm wanting to do the intention for this evening. Put this together uh, for review and just trying to generate some ideas and discussions on Article 5. And what this represents is my best attempt at uh, trying to bring some calmness and some middle ground to a very difficult, heated issue in the, in the county. And so the intent tonight is not to get into the details, it's to look at the format. There's some things I really want to highlight and show what its intention is. Um, it's a fluid document, meaning uh, setbacks in there, um, different things there, all for discussion. This by no means is me submitting a final draft. Uh, I just want to give an overview though. So just a few things, uh, anybody at home reading this, or if you go online, there's some different colors, that's Microsoft Word, that's not me, but anything that's crossed out is in the original ordinance and has been crossed out. Anything um, in color and underlined is something that I have added. And I'll try to be brief on most of these. Uh, I removed the definition of agriculture, and I'll show you why later, but it, it appears only one time in our entire ordinance. And we had a pretty lengthy discussion about what that definition means. Um, so I addressed it later on. Um, Animal feeding operation. What I, the only thing I really changed here is the state definition says where an established number. Well, I established a number of 50 or greater. It is now becomes an animal feeding operation. Um, animal units and the class sizes A, B, C, D, E, F remain the same with changes. Uh, in class F from 50 to 499, class E from 500 to 1,000 or 1,999. Um, I updated the definition of animal feeding operation. And, or did I just remove that? Looks like that's crossed off. That's crossed off. Animal units remains the same. Um, this chart would need to be updated with the different classes. So I'm going over this fairly quick, but this stuff is all. Here's, here's the, the meat, one of the major changes. So if you notice the animal uh, feeding operation, I said uh, I changed that definition to 50 animal units, and then I changed the definition of concentrated animal feeding operation to what we see here. Um, and what I've added is, it contains, to be a concentrated animal feeding operation, it contains at least 500 animal units, uh, or utilizes the liquid manure system for storage, or 
utilizes environmentally controlled housing where animals are contained in a thermostatically controlled environment. And two and three came from um, Cedar County, I believe that's their definition. So I, I kind of interject those. Four and five are, are what the state already has, discharges pollutants into the water um, and through man-made ditch or um, across through the facility, otherwise coming into contact with animals. So I left that alone. The intention here is to make it clear that animal feeding operations um, do not need CUPs. Concentrated animal feeding operations need CUPs. That was my intention to make that clear uh, what requires it and what does not. And um, there's something else I didn't mention on here, but That's the main thing. But then it also, I think those two definitions with the, the liquid manure and the, the um, thermostatically controlled environment, really the intention is to, when most people think of a CAFO or a concentrated animal feeding operation, they think of animals in confinement. And I wanted to make clear that's what we're talking about, not pastured beef cattle that come in for calving or, you know, it's a true confined animal or it's a, uh, you know, 500 head feed lot. Um, I added concentrated animal feeding operation existing. Uh, we have, in the current ordinance, it has a definition of new and it, I didn't quite, not any of them are new. If you start a new one, it's new. So I have a definition of existing. Uh, we'll just keep going to get to the major. Here's a major thing that I added, three classes of manure storage. And this comes from the Nebraska um, Ag Department. And they encourage counties in Nebraska to use it. It's not mandatory. But this is that's where I found this, and, and they separate their classes of animals by solid manure, semi-solid, um, or liquid, and then each each uh, type of facility would have its own set of rules, almost or setbacks, really, and so that's a, a major thing I kind of interjected into that. Um, permitted special use, I put in there, and I know that's unfavorable by some people, and I understand that. Um, our, our current ordinance has permitted special uses, we just don't call them that. And so, I, I'm comfortable using them, they just need to be utilized properly. Uh, permitted principal uses. So this is where they took out that definition of agriculture. This is the only place in our ordinance we use that definition. So I changed, I basically put that definition into what the permitted principal uses are. Um, basically to identify that commercial grain elevators and, and capos are not uh, permitted uses in agriculture and to kind of get rid of that dispute we have. The rest of everything in um, permitted uses, accessory structures and whatnot are what we, um, where we landed on as our last round of changes that were, that were proposed. So I left those alone. Permitted special uses is new then. Um, so what I moved, what we currently have, dwelling, single family, uh, dwellings, two family, and dwellings, additional farm, manufactured homes. Those are all currently in our ordinance as special permitted uses. We just don't call them that. So what, essentially what it is, is we say, well, you don't need a CUP, you can come in for a building permit, but there's, there's stipulations, there's requirements that we have. So what I 
did is separate those out and then I've added um, animal feeding operations pursuant, and I believe that should be CAFO maybe, pursuant to 519.23, and I'll just animal feeding operations. And then I've added concentrated animal feeding operation. Existing are allowed to expand. I have uh, 225 percent of their current size, so a 25 percent increase. That number is fluid. That is the number I picked. Um, the reason that's in there is our current ordinance allows expansion of 300 animal units. Um, I think it's important to allow some of that, and, and the main reason for this is. And it needs to be clarified, and I've got some questions on it, and it's it's helped me <laughs> see that it needs to be uh, fine tuned, especially. But the main the main reason for this is is for um, new homes that encroach on a on an existing capos ex uh, future expansion, let's say. So the intention there is if if I am a, a capo operator. And I'm already existing, and somebody comes in and let's say there's a mile setback from any home. Somebody comes in and builds a brand new house a mile from me, exactly one mile. Then I would still have some opportunity to expand my operation. Now, if that the intention here, and the, the normal wording is, doesn't say it, but when I was thinking of putting this in, the intention would be that if if uh, I'm an existing home and then a CAFO gets put in at one mile, they can't expand because they already, they blocked themselves in. The homeowner did not. So that's kind of the reasoning there. Um, I think, like I said, all these other things are what we had had discussed in uh, in the meeting our prior revision. They we have this in here, and this this probably needs. I think we have it. Okay. Well, this is basically the attempt here is if you uh, are hauling manure from outside the county. You need to get a conditional use permit, just as if you were. Minimum lot requirements. This is going to be probably heavily discussed. This is what my attempt of finding middle ground on this topic and this issue. And I changed it to two acres. Um, the you've got to meet the setbacks from a capo just as a capo has to meet from you and then you'd also i think i've got in here somewhere you've got to acknowledge that um if you encroach upon an existing capo that they do have that opportunity to expand the 25 percent or wherever we would end whatever number that ends up at so We've talked about several different ways of doing that. That's my attempt at trying to cover everybody's basis but while listening to you know everybody's concerns on property rights. I should be able to, to sell one acre, two acres. Um, I should be able to build on this. But from the producer standpoint, how can I be protected out in the egg community with you know people moving out here and I need you know people are concerned with their protection. And so that's was my attempt to address it. So um, again, all this is it's fluid and up for discussion, but what I tried to do was was carefully listen over the past two years and and um, tried to take some of the emotion out and find what I truly find is middle ground. And I think if people on either side of the issue are unhappy with some of the things in here that probably what needs to happen. We all have to give a little. Um, 
516's new that's residence requirements and that's where where the acknowledgement of an expansion if you approach on a capo uh, where you need to follow the same setbacks from a capo and what capos have to again to home so it's it's fair and equitable there uh, i don't think we did anything with traffic visibility actually i think this is what we landed on on the last one it's then 519 is is a complete rewrite um, we i tried to keep things that seemed important during our previous discussions there were some things that i really did personally think uh added to the ordinance and there were things i tried to take out that if they didn't necessarily add and it was a kind of a pita to producers but it didn't really address environmental concerns i took it out and so it's after midnight i won't go through these at length but 519 is a is a complete rewrite um i will say the real quick the intention just gonna start at the top real quick is a i tried to make it clear and and flow so 519.1, anything requiring a conditional use permit must follow everything at 519.1. 519.2, our facility setback requirements, that applies to everybody, whether you're an APO or a CAPO. So only 519.1 is for CUPs and the remaining Paragraphs two and three, um, <coughs> manure application, that applies to everybody, whether you're A4 or A4 or have a CUP. That's just the requirements within the county. And section one is, is specific to CUPs. So I tried to make that easier to understand and, and for people to open the book and say, okay, what exactly do I need to be here? And that's, I think, um manure pipelines i know that was heavily discussed oops um, i did put something in here that allows it with um landowner the adjoining landowner uh, must give permission and i thought that was kind of a middle ground versus no manure pipelines um, I know the concerns, but I also think that's a much better way of doing it than having trucks on the road. Um, setbacks should be pretty straightforward again. Um, all fluid, all up for discussion. And I don't. I must have breezed past it, but the setback table there. And I I noticed I fat fingered some things and mixed them around, but the intention here, okay, in in the general sense, facility setback chart. Um, your animal classes across the top, A, B, C, D, E, F. So if there's gonna be different setbacks for a solid manure system, a semi-solid manure system, and a liquid. And in general, and this is how Nebraska does it, the solid manure systems, uh, basically you're talking dry bee plots, uh, pasture, you know, on the, hogs in a, in a dirt lot. So solid manure systems have the least setbacks followed by semi-solid with liquid manure systems having the greatest setbacks. That's the intention of separating those classes. And again, that's what Nebraska does. Um, <clears throat> I'm not smart enough to make things up on my own, so I copy and paste from others. 
but it's late. Uh, does anybody have any questions regarding anything? Yeah. Okay. Tonight. Tonight. Yeah. Tonight. Yeah. Tonight. 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 He said, I, I don't have that kind of system on my computer that I could go to. There were those pins on there. I could go to. Oh, oh that had to review the markups. Yeah, I could do that. That has with all the lines and everything. Oh, sure. You yeah. just want, yeah. I think the one I sent you is just a black and white yeah. version. Well, and, and that's fine if it's got the lines or different. It's trying to expand a little bit. I mean, it's quite small. I don't, I don't like to do that. Well, let me know when I send it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got public comment? Yep. You on the list? Yep. Great. Let's go. Oh, sorry. My name is George Fournier, and I'm a urologist at the Yankton Medical And, uh, I mean, it's a little late. I don't want to get into everything I wanted to talk about, but I think the, the one thing that the county commission needs to understand is uh, how dangerous time farms are uh, in terms of uh, in terms of viral spread. There, there is very bad epidemiologic evidence that they actually speed up the spread of, uh, of pandemic viruses. And for the most part, it's influenza. There are strains of influenza that are developing in the, in the uh, Vietnam you know, uh, region and China region that have mortality rates that are up to 80% for small outbreaks. Uh, the impact of our economy, the impact on our economy of coronavirus would look like uh, 50 weeks compared to some of the stuff that is, is, is being uh, generated in Southeast Asia. And this is influenza, it's not coronavirus. The reason the pig is so dangerous is because the, the pig is able to be infected by both avian and human viruses at the same time. And it's because they have the receptors in their respiratory tract that will accept both viruses. Now, when that happens, you get a mixing of the viruses. And the, you, in such a way that you get a hybrid virus uh, out of the same animal. That can then infect the, uh, the capital worker who then can take it home. Um, concentrated uh, hog feeding operations, uh, hog capitals cause a very rapid spread from one animal to the next. And, and you, could just, you just need one animal infected and within two weeks the entire, entire barn is infected, including the, 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 uh, the workers. Um, the coronavirus just sort of came out of, out of nowhere. And um, there, there is some early evidence to indicate, well, it doesn't indicate it, it actually shows it that pigs can also be infected with COVID-19. And um, um, they just can't amplify the virus or grow it as well as they can the influenza virus. And so these setbacks that Joe has, uh, has put are, are really not adequate. I mean, these, the, uh, the concentration of capitals in any given county is gonna determine how rapidly a virus will spread within the county. And the fact that you have the international um, importation of, of pigs from different herds from different parts of the world that are poorly screened, it's just a perfect invitation to have one of these highly malignant uh, viruses um, find out in the United States. Um, Three minutes. 
Okay. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to give a copy of the um, of the epidemiologic evidence in, in uh, North Carolina that shows how the H1N1 pandemic progressed in North Carolina. And uh, um, it's very clear that, that in the counties that had the highest concentration of capitals, they had the highest, highest progression of, of, the, of the virus. And just as an example, we all know what happened in Sioux Falls with the coronavirus and that nuclear plant. How quickly did it, did it spread once the nuclear plant got, got going? So um, I, I would recommend that that, the, that there be a limit on the number of hog capitals, especially in many given counties, as a as a social distancing effort to prevent uh, to prevent the rapid spread of influenza viruses. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Anybody else want to speak for public comment? Or can we have a motion? Okay. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.